യൂട്യൂബ് ഒക്കെ കിട്ടുന്നുണ്ട് ഹലോ ഹലോ കിട്ടുന്നുണ്ടല്ലേ സാറേ കിട്ടുന്നുണ്ട് ഓക്കെ
Welcome to the concluding session of the one week faculty development program on higher education during COVID times and after challenges and opportunities. Organized by the internal quality assurance cell, Bishapur College, Maveli Khera, in academic collaboration with the Kerala State Higher Education Council. It has been an extremely fruitful endeavor till date, and I'm sure that today's talk shall be no exception. Today we shall have Dr. Madhu S. Nair, who shall talk on research productivity and quality. Dr. Madhu S. Nair is currently working as an associate professor at the Department of Computer Science, Cochin University of Science and Technology, QSAT. He's done his BCA, his MCA. He was a topper in the Bachelor of Computer Applications course, and uh, he passed with a first rank in 2003, a master uh, MCA, and he did his master's in computer science MTech with specialization in digital image computing from the University of Kerala with the first rank in the year 2008. He obtained his PhD in computer science image processing from Mahatma Gandhi University in the year 2013. He also holds a postgraduate diploma in client service computing from Amrita Institute of Computer Technology. He had also qualified his net for lectureship conducted by the UGC in the year 2004 and a graduate aptitude test uh, in engineering gate conducted by the Indian Institute of Technology, IIT in 2006. He has published 101 research papers in reputed international journals and conference proceedings published by I, uh, various agencies. He is a senior member of the Institute of uh, Electrical and Electronics Engineers, member of Association for Computing Machinery, Associate Life Member of Computer Society of India, and member of International Association of Engineers. He is a recipient of prestigious awards like Swami Vivekananda, Yuva Pratibha Puruskaram of Government of Kerala, Best Thesis Supervisor from IEEE Communication Society, IETE Srimati Mano Manorama Rathor Memorial Award, CSI Distinguished Assistant Professor Award, SSI Young System Scientist Award, IEI Young Engineers Award, AICTE Career Award for Young Teachers, CSI Paper Presenter Award at International Conference, uh, INAE Innovative Student Projects Award for the Best MTech Thesis, AICTE Travel Grant Award, Most Active Editorial Member Reviewer Award from the International Arab Journal of Information Technology, and Best Paper Award during International Conference on Advances in Computing and Communications. He has also received the Most Prominent Alumni Award from MES College Alwa, Computer Science Alumni Association Award for Securing First Rank in MTech, Students' Union Award for Securing First Rank in MCA, Gold Medal for Securing First Rank in BCA. He is serving as a reviewer for around 50 international journals published by IEEE and various other agents and publications. He is also uh, served as a technical program committee member, reviewer for several reputed national and international conferences. He is currently the associate editor of the pre prestigious IEE Access Journal and also uh, he is serving uh, as uh, an uh, editorial board member of, uh, as I said, the International Arab Journal. He is uh, also a member of the Board of Studies, PG Rajagiri College of Social Sciences, Kochi, member Board of Studies, University of Kerala, member Board of Studies, University of Calicut, and member Board of Studies, University of Kerala. His research interests include digital image processing, pattern recognition, computer vision, data compression, and soft computing. Now that's quite a bioreta, quite a resume. And uh, so we have a very, very eminent speaker with us for today's talk. Dear participants, before I hand over the session to Sir, I would uh, like to remind you all to post your feedback after the session, as you know, you can voice your doubts, your concerns, your questions in the chat box as you've been doing all these days. I now request, I now most humbly request Dr. Madhu Esnaya to please take over. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anu, for your kind words. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ranjan Matthew for I guess a coordinator for inviting me for uh, this webinar series. And I'm extremely happy uh, to share the knowledge that I've acquired as part of my research. And that doesn't mean that I'm a person who knows uh, everything about the topic that I'm going to uh, deliver. 
I am still a learner. I am still a student. Uh, so whatever knowledge I have acquired, I will definitely share with you. I hope this session uh, you will really uh, enjoy. Uh, so we move on uh, to the uh, presentation. Uh, so. Uh, So I hope all of you can uh, see the PPT. Uh, so the topic that I'm going to deliver today is very relevant, I should say, at this particular point of time, because you know we are uh, facing a lot of problems now due to the spread of this coronavirus, and you know all the uh, I mean I, I should say some of the important reforms are happening in the field of education. And I think already you might have discussed uh, about those topics as part of this webinar series. And I think this is the right time uh, for the scholars, for the research scholars also to change their attitude uh, towards uh, the research work. And uh, that may finally <coughs> consequently lead to a better research productivity. So before I begin uh, this lecture, I, sh uh, I should mention about one article which was published by uh, Elsevier India very recently. Uh, they have uh, studied about the research productivity of the universities in Kerala. And uh, when I saw the report, I was a little bit uh, disappointed uh, because uh, the research impact index value, which they have computed, is only 0.77, which is below the average performance value of 1.00, which means that all the state universities uh, in Kerala has to work a lot in order to have a better research impact value. And, uh, and I think uh, as part of this session, we can have a discussion about how uh, this research productivity uh, can be analyzed quantitatively uh, so that uh, whenever we make such kind of study by various publishers like Elsevier and all, our productivity will be at a higher uh, value. Uh, so today I'm going to discuss about uh, the quantitative analysis of research productivity and what is the role of journal indexing and cytometrics. And I know that some of the participants might have already completed their PhD program, so they may be knowing uh, maybe better than me about certain aspects. Uh, but uh, cytometrics, I don't know how many of you are aware of it. Uh, so we, if possible, if time is there, we will have a, a detailed discussion on that. So. Uh, First of all, uh, I would like to start with a quoting that there is no way to get experience except through experience. And uh, my experience I'm actually sharing here. Uh, and I hope you are also, maybe you may also be experienced in this research activity. So, uh, so we need experience in order to talk about these aspects. So that's what I said, whatever uh, knowledge I've acquired as part of my research, I'm going to share with you. And you know, uh, we all, publish papers uh, and you know ideally uh, why we publish papers it's very clear that is to share the research findings and discoveries with the hope of improving the existing systems that's, that's why we do research we know that some systems are prevailing and we want to improve those uh, systems so that uh, so that uh, the, it will give a good output to the common uh, people or to the society uh, so that's what ideally a research means. And practically, you know, there are a lot of advantages if you do research. If you want to do further research, you need funding. And if you want to get uh, funding from various agencies, we need to publish papers to get promoted and sometimes to get a job and to keep your job. Uh, keep your job means in, in foreign universities and all, they're all tenure track faculty members. So if they want to keep their job, uh, their productivity should be high. So publishing papers is very important uh, for them. And let me tell you that the scientists are always rated by what they finish and not by what they attempt. We can always say that we are trying to develop, we are trying to develop, we can always say like that. But unless you finish that work and publish it, you will not be rated by the academic and the research fraternity. Uh, so 
So a very, very gentle introduction about the process of research. I know that most of you are familiar with this, but those who are planning to do research for them, it will be useful. I will quickly uh, explain about this. Uh, so the first step is definitely you have to complete your work in your domain. And then the next aspect is the preparation of the manuscript uh, that should be based on the, uh, the style of the journal to which you are planning to communicate. And then you have to go to the concerned uh, website or the portal, uh, the manuscript submission portal and submit your manuscript online. And then immediately it will be sent to the editorial office and the editorial office will go through all the, uh, will check whether uh, it followed, it actually followed all the instructions given in the journal. The template has been rightly followed and all. And if everything is okay, uh, the editorial office will send the document or the manuscript to the editor in chief. And the editor in chief uh, will go through it and if it is worth reviewing, that manuscript will be sent to uh, an associate editor who is in charge of that particular topic. And the associate editor uh, will uh, send this manuscript uh, to after the initial review. Uh, he will also do some initial review. And after that, he will send it to several reviewers all over the world, maybe three or four reviewers. That is the discretion of the associate editor. And uh, they will uh, give some, associate editor will give some time as per the journal policy. And after maybe two months or three months or four months, uh, the associate editor will receive the review comments from the experts and based on that he will consolidate the review report and take a decision either it can be a rejection or it can be a uh, revision uh, so if it is a revision uh, we have to again rework on that work based on the comments received by the reviewers and then we have to resubmit the document along with a very important document that is known as the rebuttal letter or we call it as the response to the reviewers comments so the rebuttal letter is one important document that has to be submitted along with the revised manuscript. And again, it has to be submitted online and the associate editor will go through the revised manuscript and at the same time, he will go through the uh, rebuttal letter and see whether all the comments have been addressed by the, uh, um, the, man, the, the authors of the manuscript. And uh, uh, once everything is okay, we'll again send it for the for review to the experts. And finally, after a series of such kind of revisions, it may be two or three or four revisions. And finally, uh, again, it can be a decision, a binary decision, like either it can be rejected or it can be accepted. If it is a rejection, again, you have to rework on your uh, paper and submit it as a new manuscript. And if it is acceptance, it will go to the production. And I'm going to talk about uh, this aspect. Uh, what happens after it gets accepted? Um, earlier days, you know, once the paper is accepted, uh, it has to wait for a long time in the queue to get it published. And only when the print version comes, the, re uh, the readers will get a chance to uh, go through the manuscript. But now the situation has changed, as all of you know, uh, as soon as the paper gets accepted, uh, the, some initial procedures has to be followed, like you have to transfer the copyright, uh, you will receive the proof of the manuscript, you have to go through that and approve the proof, and all such uh, procedures are over, it will immediately come online. So anyone in the world can download the manuscript uh, immediately uh, without waiting for that manuscript to be assigned to any volume or issue. Before that itself, you can download it. Uh, but the problem there is if you if you download such manuscripts, which are which are which we call it as article in press or online first, um, there are several names for such kind of uh, papers, which has been just very recently accepted. So it does not have any volume number or issue number or pages, number, the page numbers and the year of uh, publication. In such cases, how you will refer such document in the reference list. So in that case, uh, we have to make sure that if you download such a manuscript and put it in the reference list, it is very important that the authors of those papers will get a citation. That assurance we have to give, definitely we have to give. So how we can do that? If for, uh, uh, with the advancement of this um, uh, information technology that is possible and how that is possible is because of this an identifier known as the uh, digital object identifier doi i think uh, most of you might have seen this doi number in the manuscript or maybe in the abstract page of uh, the paper you might have seen this so this is, this is also one uh, important aspect as far as uh, the indexing is concerned so DUI is nothing but a, a unique number assigned to a publication. Uh, if I, if I uh, compare that with the uh, real-life example, uh, the Anadha number uh, in 
all of you have aadhar number aadhar number is like a unique number given to the citizen and whether you change the address or not your aadhar number will never will never change uh, so uh, the, the advantage of using this uh, dui number is that you can give some unique number at the answer and um, uh, the the dui number is like this it will have the kanna ka pottu poya kanna kanna illa some disturbance is there kanna illa ani doctor anu can i pass that participant to switch off kanna illa Please mute it, sir. Please continue. Okay, okay. So, if you look at the DUI number, uh, it, it will have two parts. Uh, one is known as the prefix part, and the other is known as the uh, suffix part. Uh, the prefix part is actually uh, given by um, uh, an agency known as International DUI Federation. It's known as IDF. Uh, so, uh, you might have seen for the Springer Journal, you might have heard about Springer, right? Springer Publishers. Springer Journal will have a, a prefix value of ten point one zero zero seven. So that ten indicates uh, that it's it's a digital document. It's based on the Uniform Resource Identifier standard. So ten indicates uh, that it is a digital document, and the four digit that it follows it indicates the publisher. So ten point zero one zero zero seven means it's a Springer publisher. Then we will separate it with a slash, and then you will have certain alpha numeric characters, a combination of alpha numeric characters. and that alphanumeric characters will be given by the publisher uh, as per the standards of idf international dui federation so that uh, the prefix plus suffix together it will be a unique id given to that particular uh, publication for elsevier it is 10.1016 like that it goes on now the advantage is that when you download a paper as i mentioned earlier when I, when you download a paper which has not been assigned to any volume or issue make sure that when you put it in the reference list you add this dui number Uh, that will be a good practice to make sure that the authors will get the citation uh, normally we give like this the author name comma then uh, the, the title of the paper then comma then then the uh, journal name and then volume number and all so here volume number is not available so in that case what we do is after this journal name you can put uh, uh, the doi number there as the uh, as the as a unique number of that uh, document so that we can make sure that they will get uh, citation Uh, so this site you can uh, visit where you can type the DUI number here and press the submit button, then automatically uh, it will go to that document. And another advantage of this DUI is that it's like a, a pointer to a metadata. Metadata means this DUI number points to a repository where this document is residing. I think you might be uh, aware of an error which you might have normally uh, you might have uh, seen uh, when you try to access a document. that is known as a 404 error found right the 404 error that is a file not found error and if you have this dui number uh, we can make sure that such error will never occur because as per the idf standards if a dui number is assigned to a document then any user can should be able to access this document by using this dui number that is the actual condition given put forward by uh, the idf so if you have this dui number automatically it will go to that repository even if the repository is changed Uh, from the from the user's point of view there is no need to bother about it uh, you can use the same dui number and you can access the document i will just give you one simple example uh, one research paper which i published uh, way back in 2012 or 13 i think so it was published by springer and later this journal was uh, the control of the journal was taken by the taylor and francis uh, you might have heard of t and f taylor and francis and but the earlier papers were published by springer so it has got the dui number of 10.1007 slash like that and uh, alpha numeric character so that is the um, uh, dui number assigned to those paper but when the taylor and francis took over the control of this journal still the dui number was the same now you know in 2012 when i tried to click this link it will go to the springer link uh, website but now the same dui number when i click it it is now going to the taylor and francis repository but i am not bothered about whether uh, whether this journal is still being published by springer or whether it is being taken over by taylor and francis as far as i am concerned i am just using this dui number and automatically it goes to the new repository so it is the uh, responsibility of the publisher to change this meta records at the idf server so uh, from the user's point of view it is very easy if you use this dui number and another advantage is that uh, in your home page uh, in your web page if you want to give a link 
uh, to your publication, uh, instead of giving the direct link of the repository, you always try to use uh, the link of your paper using the DUI number. Uh, the link will look like this. Can you see here? It will look like this https colon slash slash doi dot org then a slash then you just simply copy that doi number of your paper it will form a web link so you can just put it in that home page your website whoever comes and visit your page when it, when they click this link automatically it will go to the corresponding uh, repository so i hope it is clear so by using doi number you can create a web link also by using this particular uh, format and this is also a site where you can just simply copy the DUA number and press this go button, automatically it will go to the repository. And if you look at the papers, you can see that this is a paper published by IEEE. On the bottom left, you can see the DUA number printed. Uh, this is Elsevier. Uh, Elsevier also, yeah, the DUA number is printed on the bottom left. This is Springer. You can see it is displayed on the top left. You can see the DUA number. It starts with 10.1007 slash and a set of alphanumeric characters. Now coming to the indexing. So if you want to talk about sinometrics, it's very important that you cover indexing part also. Very quickly, we will we'll go through the various indexing sites and then we'll come to the sinometrics part. Uh, you know, uh, indexing is very important uh, as far as the uh, as far as the sharing or disseminating the um, research uh, papers, disseminating information about the research paper is concerned. So uh, indexing is very important. Uh, a simple example I can quote you, uh, we are all familiar with the index page given in the textbook, you know that it is given at the, at the end of the textbook. So we use that index page for, uh, for finding a particular term. Uh, because you might have read that textbook maybe two or three times, but if you want to find out uh, the definition of a particular term, what do you do? You will go immediately go to the index page and uh, the index terms are uh, listed alphabet in alphabetical order there. You find out the term and then you will get the page number there and immediately you will come to that page and read that uh, definition. In the same way, research papers also should be properly indexed. That is, the readers should come to a place where they can get information about the research papers, read the general details like the title, abstract, keywords, and if they are okay, they can go to the corresponding, um, uh, they can download the corresponding research paper. So we need some, some abstract or indexing site where we can see uh, the papers published in various journals and conference proceedings. And that will give more visibility to your research papers. So whenever you publish research papers, whether it is in journal or whether it is in conference proceedings, make sure that it has been indexed somewhere so that people sitting at different parts of the world can just can see this, uh, can get an information that such an article has been published. Uh, and they can, if, if, they, if they're really uh, interested in reading that, they can come and read it or download it. So one such indexing site is known as uh, the Indian Science Abstract, which is at the national level. And it is managed by NISCARE, National Institute of Science, Communication and Information Resources, New Delhi. And NISCARE is under CSIR. And it indexes several journals, conference proceedings, theses, etc. And let me tell you that when you see the name of this abstract, uh, uh, sorry, the indexing site, uh, Indian Science Abstract, uh, don't uh, think that they index only the science journals. They also index social science, arts and humanities journals too. Uh, so this is one popular uh, indexing site uh, at the uh, national uh, level. Uh, there are other sites also, other uh, indexing sites also, but I'm not mentioning here because I, I, I don't rely on those sites because they are not properly managing uh, uh, the abstracts of the papers published at the national level. And this is the only one uh, indexing site uh, which I am, uh, which I feel that uh, they are managing it well. And the other sites I'm not, uh, not actually uh, satisfied, I should say. Uh, so this is the standard indexing site at the national level, Indian Science Abstracts. So when you get time, you just visit there. You can see the different volumes of these abstracts available there. So this is the website of Indian Science Abstracts. So when you get time, you visit it. Now at the international level, uh, if you look at the indexing site, the most popular, I think you, this word you might have heard about is Corpus. Uh, it's a, it's, we, I, I just want to say that it's the world's largest indexing site. Uh, I'm using the word largest. Uh, and it is managed by Elsevier. And uh, you know, as per the UGC uh, care uh, policy, uh, that is, you know, that new journalist 
has been managed by UGC now. Uh, so if you go to the concerned UGC care list website, I will show that. Uh, I think I've already included that in the slide. Uh, one link uh, is actually uh, goes to the Scopus site uh, where you can search for the journals. I will show the link later. Uh, so this is the world's largest indexing site. It indexes several international journals and conference proceedings. Uh, but that doesn't mean that all the journals indexed in Scopus are of high quality. I have also seen certain paid journals also included in Scopus, but I don't want to discuss it now. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we can say it's, it's a very comprehensive, uh, uh, they have, they're managing a comprehensive list of uh, journals. Uh, and the point that I would like to mention here is that uh, if you have, if you are publishing or if you have already uh, uh, published uh, a, a research paper in a conference proceedings or uh, in a journal, indexed by Scopus, you will uh, be having a Scopus uh, author ID. And this Scopus author ID, you can you can get it from that URL itself. Uh, when you try to access, I will tell you how it can be uh, obtained. Uh, so this, uh, this Scopus author ID, if you want to get it, uh, make sure that you have published at least one paper in a Scopus indexed journal or conference proceedings and if you if you if you feel that you have already published such papers you can search for your profile because once you have the scopus author id you will have a profile page uh, in the scopus repository and i will show you uh, how you can get this scopus uh, profile with it uh, so for that you have to go through this link uh, you can just google it i think all of you are very good in googling so just google it uh, with scopus author lookup you will get this link and uh, uh, once you click this link, uh, you will get a page like this where you are asked to give the author name and author last name and author first name. So I've given here Nair as my last name and first name as Madhu. And if you want to, uh, to, to make it more refined search, you can give appellation here. But I'm not given here appellation. I'm just giving only the last name and first name. Once it is given, you can, you can, you can press this search button. Uh, then automatically uh, it will go to the uh, next uh, site so this is how it looks like now we can see that it shows uh, three records uh, nair madhu s of Cochin university the nair madhu k of texas a and college of dentistry nair madhu g of bhava atomic research center so i know that i belong to this so i i know that this is the record belonging to me so what i do is i will click this link nair madhu s is again a link i can click that and when i click it it will go to uh, this particular page so here you can see that my name is given, my affiliation is given. It shows how many documents I have published, which are indexed in uh, Scopus uh, database, and how many citations I have received for those 89 papers. But, and it shows that 579 citations from how many documents? 500 documents, because some documents might have cited more than one paper belonging to me. So that may be the reason why it's 579. So 579 total citations from how many documents? 500 documents and i've got an h index value of 14. we will see what is meant by h index later uh, so it shows all these uh, citation details uh, here and also a graph also shown which is very easy to understand in each year how many how many documents i've published and how many citations i have received so it is plotted here and uh, it, we can also see around 10 documents latest published 10 documents we can see and if the rest of the documents if you want to see you should have a login id uh, so uh, otherwise you cannot uh, see the uh, other publications. So it will show only the 10 uh, latest publications that you can see. But since I belong to PISAT, I have this access to this ID. So when I when I go to the department and when I try to access this, I will get the complete details. So in your college, if you don't have that access ID, you can see only up to 10 publications of that order. So this is how it looks like. And when you try to access this web page, if you look at the URL, uh, at the URL you can you can see a uh, ID and that is the, actually the Scopus uh, author ID. So I will just show that how uh, how it looks like. Uh, so this is uh, the page that I've shown earlier. Uh, this is the page I've shown. Uh, so this is how the record looks like. Uh, so you can see here. In the, in, the, in the URL, you can see here uh, this number. This is what I'm talking about. This is the author ID of uh, that, uh, that particular author. So for me, the, 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 
I got the uh, Scopus author ID like this. So I can note it down and in certain institutions, top institutions, they ask for this Scopus author ID. Uh, why? Because they want to see our contributions uh, um, as part of our research works. So if I give this Scopus ID, they can, they can create this link automatically and they can come to this page and see my uh, research details. So that's why they are asking for um, uh, this Scopus author ID. So this is the author ID that you have to note down. Okay, uh, so, so this is about the Scopus and how to search for uh, search whether a journal is indexed in Scopus, there is a page, I will show that later. Uh, so I will show how we can search for a journal which is indexed in Scopus, uh, that I will show you later. Okay, this is a very important one. Uh, you can see that uh, in the previous slide, in this slide I have shown about uh, I've shown my name is given here and just below that uh, you can see the ORCID ID shown here and if you want to include this ORCID ID here first you have to create an ORCID ID and uh, that is known as the open researcher and contributor ID and you can create that free of cost so if if you have not um, uh, obtained uh, the ORCID ID try to get it today itself um, this ORCID ID is again like uh, DOA or Aadhaar number it's a unique number given to a researcher um, the reason why we want the ORCID ID, I will tell you with an example. I told you, you know, this, this is the record which is shown by Scopus when I try to search with last name and first name, right? Some case, in some cases, what happens, you know, sometimes you may change your institution. Uh, so your affiliation will change. Sometimes you may get change your research topic. So, uh, uh, so in such situations, the Scopus uh, database will uh, automatically create a new record by thinking that um, uh, that you have you are you are doing you are a different person doing research in a particular or a new domain so if such uh, incident happens uh, the scopus since it is done automatically scopus will consider you as a new author and you can create a different record so what happens is suppose i am changing my affiliation from kisai to maybe mahatma gandhi university and i'm publishing a paper uh, there maybe later you can have another nayar madhu as here with uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, University. But uh, the, the papers which I published when I was with Kusat is also the same, uh, belong to the same order. So in such cases, what, ha what happens, you know, I have to send a mail uh, to, the, uh, to the Scopus uh, um, uh, feedback system and they will go through the publications and finally they will merge these two records and it will get it, get it as a single record. If you are not doing this, you know what happens? the US citations will be split among these records. That should not happen. Because what happens if it is if, if the publications that you made from a different institution is considered as a different record, all the citations received for those papers will be in that record. But actually together you have higher number of citations. So that will be split among two records. So that should not happen. And you know, Scopus actually creates records after publication, right? But ORCID, what it does is, the ORCID ID has to be given at the time of submission itself at the time of manuscript submission itself uh, because most of the leading journals like Elsevier, IEEE, Springer, Trailer and Francis, World Scientific, all those publishers, they ask for your ORCID ID during the time of uh, uh, manuscript submission to make, uh, to, to reveal your identity. So at the time of manuscript submission itself, your ORCID ID is given. So the advantage is that once your paper gets accepted, uh, you have already linked this ID, ORCID ID with Scopus. So after publication, automatically this record will go to those that particular uh, Scopus ID to which this ORCID ID is linked. That's what I have shown you. You can see that my ORCID ID is linked with this particular profile. So whatever publication I make um, uh, with this ORCID ID, automatically it will be indexed in this particular record. So the duplication of the records can be avoided if you use this ORCID uh, ID. And I think in uh, now most of the journals are not have not made it mandatory to give the ORCID ID. You can skip that step, but in soon I think uh, they will make it mandatory so that uh, so that you will be forced to give the ORCID ID during the time of manuscript submission. So it's better you create an ORCID ID today itself if you have not uh, opened up an account here. Right. Then this I will quickly skip because this this EBSCO publishing is very popular among the social science researchers. So if anybody from social science background is attending uh, this webinar series, um, uh, you can definitely go through this uh, website. EBSCO is an indexing site where which indexes both the science, technology, and 
social science related journals, but it is very famous among the social science researchers because it publishes a variety of social science journals which are not actually indexed in Scopus and R. So that's why we also consider this indexing site uh, for the social science. That's why I included this. Subsco is very popular among social science researchers. And another one is um, ResearchGate. And I hope some of you might be uh, might have already used this research gate. Uh, it's it's actually a social network, but it's not like the other social networks because it's it's also an indexing site, and at the same time it uh, shows uh, your uh, citation uh, details and publication details. Uh, as a normal social networks, it will not show all those details. So it's mainly meant for the research uh, scholars. And here uh, the advantage is that uh, if you become a member of this research gate. Uh, you can uh, establish a good rapport uh, with the uh, top researchers in the field and it may also lead to some kind of joint research collaboration so in that sense this research gate is very good uh, but i've seen uh, this research gate uh, site being misused uh, by certain scholars uh, uh, how, how it is misused uh, because most of the people uh, try to upload their document full document full text uh, to this research gate and let me tell you that uh, it's it's if it if it's not an open access paper, definitely uh, it will be a violation. If it's an open access paper, it's not a problem because uh, it can be downloaded from uh, anywhere uh, without paying any any uh, money. But if it is not an open access paper, and if you try to upload the full text, then uh, it's, you are actually cheating that publisher. So you should not do that. It's a violation of the copyright. Uh, because you have already given the copyright to the publisher and uh, then anyone who want to download that paper should visit that concerned repository and download it by paying the money so that is a rule but if you put your because you might have received other copy of your paper right other pdf you might have received once you publish the research paper every others will get a copy and if you try to upload this copy in the research gate anyone who is a member of research gate can freely download this full text so that is a violation of the copyright i have not uploaded any full text uh, here unless it is a an open access paper otherwise you should never um, upload the full text here uh, you have to be very careful and i also given my research scholars also the clear direction that you should, they should not upload the full text there uh, otherwise this work is very good it will show uh, the latest papers published by the scholars uh, and uh, the various projects they are involved in you can start joint research projects here so um, as far as the establishing the relationship and the collaboration is concerned this site is very good so try to uh, try to uh, become a member of this uh, this site and here they are also showing one uh, scientometric value known as rg score research gate score like 28.44 but i have sent several <laughs> mails asking them to reveal the formula of this uh, rg score because all the scientometrics uh, um, uh, values have associated formula and they have already published it but i don't know why rg score is not publishing it i think they i don't know what kind of formula they are using but they, i think they use uh, several uh, parameters like number of downloads number of reads uh, number of citations all these aspects will come into this value but i am not sure whether this this particular value is, uh, is good or not so what i do is i know some good researchers in the field in my field so I will just look at their RG score and do relative comparison. That's what I do. So I am not sure whether this 20, I cannot say 28.4 is a very good value or not. But I, when I compare with my uh, peer group members, uh, I, I will get some idea about whether my um, uh, contribution is good or not. That's how I compare this RG score value. All right. OK, so try to become a member uh, if you are interested. Arnett Miner is also another uh, social network, same as ResearchGate, but I think it's better you go for uh, ResearchGate, that will be good. But this is also a, a very good a social network designed by uh, Tsinghua University, uh, but those who are interested, they can, can uh, join in this network. And two giants in the IT field, uh, Google Scholar and Microsoft Academic Research, both these uh, companies have their own products for uh, the research uh, indexing or journal indexing, so the research paper indexing or journal indexing. One is the Google Scholar and the other is the academic research at Microsoft.com. But I prefer Google uh, Scholar because of the simplicity and the accuracy. I prefer Google Scholar. Uh, but if you are interested, you can also go and visit academic research at Microsoft.com. Uh, but uh, I am going to explain more about Google Scholar because I prefer that personally because. Uh, Google Scholar is the most widely used um, 
uh, journal indexing site uh, and also to show the research productivity of a, as a scholar, uh, they use this particular site. Even in foreign universities and even in IITs around, they use this Google Scholar profile. Uh, so I will I will explain about the Google Scholar profile um, uh, later. I will show how how we can manage the profile and all. I will, I will explain that later. Now coming to the next international indexing site. So when I talked about Scopus, I told that uh, Scopus is the largest uh, indexing site, right? But uh, but I I'm, I would like to use the word reputed indexing site uh, here because Science Citation Index is considered as the world's reputed indexing site, and it was actually started by uh, Institute for Scientific Information, and then it was owned by Tom uh, Thomson Reuters, and later it was owned by Clarivate Analytics, and now. Uh, Clarivate Analytics manages this Science Citation Index site, and now uh, all the products uh, under this uh, Thomson Reuters related to the Citation Index uh, is managed by the Clarivate Analytics under the Master Journal List uh, record or MJL database, Master Journal uh, List database. So all the indexed uh, journal list is there in this Master uh, Journal List, and uh, I, I, as I told earlier. Uh, the UGC care list gives a link to the Scopus, right? In the same way, UGC gives a link to the um, MJL clarivate.com site where all the um, uh, AC index journals are listed. Or sometimes we call it as the Web of Science uh, journal. Web of Science is actually a, a, a product through which you can search which all journals have been indexed in SA and all. So we call it as the Web of Science uh, journals, WIS journals. So uh, this link uh, can be used to find out whether the journal has been indexed or not. And the same link is given in the UGC care list site. Uh, so I will show how we can check whether this, uh, whether the journal is indexed in uh, SA or not. I will show you. This is the website that you will get when you click that mjl.clarivate.com. When you, when you click this site, uh, you will, when you click that link, you will get uh, a page like this. Here you can type uh, the title of the journal, or if you want, you can give the ISSN number of your journal, the eight digit. You might have seen the eight digit ISSN number. So when you give the ISSN number, make sure that you test with uh, the two ISSNs. One is known as a print ISSN, and the other is known as the e ISSN, that is the electronic ISSN. Uh, so some journals will have two ISSN numbers, one for the print version and the other for the electronic version. So you have to test with both. Or you can just simply type the title of the journal here, uh, and you can uh, search uh, for it. So when you when you click this this particular button, uh, if it is indexed, when you click this particular button, if it is indexed, it will show like this. So I, I was searching for a journal named Artificial Intelligence in Medicine, and it shows that um, uh, it's there. Uh, so Artificial Intelligence in Medicine is actually, uh, that is the exact match. You can see here it's shown as the exact match. Uh, so um, uh, it's, a, it's an SCA indexed journal. But here they are not writing it as SCI. You can see here, it is known as the SCIE, or we call it as Science Citation Index Expanded. Uh, so it's actually another product of uh, Clarivate Analytics, uh, where they, in order to include more journals into the uh, SCI list, they diluted certain conditions and added more journals to the list. And that list is actually known as the Science Citation Index uh, Index Expanded. But now when they form this master journal list. All these journals are shown under the category Science Citation Index Expanded. So whether your journal is SCA indexed or SCIE indexed, we consider it as Science Citation Indexed uh, journals. So this is how we can we can search for a journal in the uh, master journal list of Web of Science Group, right? And this is the uh, and, and let me tell you that. Uh, uh, this SCI um, uh, is not the only product of this Clarivate Analytics. They also have products like uh, Social Science Citation Index, that is known as the SSCI. Uh, so uh, some people have the misunderstanding that the social science journals are not indexed in this web of science. It is indexed, and that product is known as SSCI. So in such for such journals, here it will be written as Social Science Citation Index. So it will be written like that. And another product is that it is known as ESCI, Emerging Sources Citation Index. And I've seen several people uh, coming and telling that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that I have published a paper in SA, SA Index Journal. So when I search for the journal here, it will be shown as uh, Emerging Sources Citation Index and not as Science Citation Index expanded. So what does this Emerging Sources Citation Index means? 
uh, let me tell you that emerging sources citation index is not science citation index it simply means that this journal has got the potential to be included in science citation index or science citation index expanded list which means that they are under scrutiny or they are under uh, the uh, because the the publisher the clarivate analytics is currently monitoring that journal and uh, they uh, they may be maybe after two or three years of monitoring they may include this journal in the uh, science citation index expanded list so that means they are under scrutiny now so esca doesn't mean that the journal is sca index but maybe maybe in the future it will be included in um sci index expanded so emerging sources citation index should not be misunderstood as sci uh, so let me tell, tell you that if somebody comes and tell you that it is esci index it's not science citation index it's emerging sources citation index so uh, i just want to make a clarification on that so this is the ugc care uh, list i we were talking about um earlier ugc was managing a jumbo list of uh, journals but now they have changed it now they have formed a very um, elegant uh, list of uh, journals i should say and they have divided it into uh, two groups um, one is known as the ugc list uh, care list group 1 and the other is known as the ugc care list group 2 ugc care list group 1 is actually the journals after thorough scrutiny they will include it in the list and there are a lot of procedures to be followed if, if you want a journal to be included in the ugc care list group 1 and i think only 500 to 600 journals are currently indexed in the ugc care list group one because i'm not going through that group one i always look at the other database journal so i think it's now uh, 500 to 600 journals are there now ugc care list group 2 uh, is actually uh, refers about the globally recognized databases and one is corpus and the other is uh, sci or social science citation index all those list together we call it as the master journal list of web of science and that two indexed site index databases that is corpus and uh, web of science that forms the ugc care list group 2 so if you are publishing a paper in one of uh, publishing a paper in a journal um, indexed in corpus or sci it's approved by ugc there is no need to um, uh, go through any other list or not because this is enough it's very clearly written there and this is the list i am talking about this is the first group you can search for the journals in that list they already uploaded that details there this is the uh, ugc care list group 2 i was talking about you can see that web of science has got uh, three products one is known as the arts and humanities citation index arts and humanities that is for the arts and humanities journal is again managed by clarivate analytics arts and humanities citation index a h c i the other is the science citation index expanded that i was talking about they clubbed uh, this sci and sci e together and now they call it as science citation index expanded and the third is known as a social sciences citation index so the all the three products are under the web of science and is managed by clarivate analytics and you can search for those journals in the mgl.clarivate.com uh, site and the second uh, database is a scopus that we have already seen uh, and the web page i will show you now how you can search for a journal in scopus i will show later um, the web of science i have already shown that that is the mjl.clarivate.com you can go there and search for uh, the journal so this is the ugc care list group 2 and this is how you can search for uh, the group 1 journals you can you can search for uh, those journals here so and just so these are the products i was talking about science citation index social science citation index then ahc arts and humanities citation index and this is the uh, uh, product i was talking about which most people are uh, uh, misunderstood i think uh, this is actually an indexing uh, pro indexing product which is not uh, comes under these three categories this is actually known as the emerging sources citation index so i told as i told earlier uh, only those journals which has got the potential to be included uh, in the Uh, in one of the, these three products will be included in esca so getting included in esca doesn't mean that it is indexed in sca or ssca or nhci so be very clear about it and it also um, like clarivate analytics also has two more products that is known as a cpcis that is a conference proceeding citation index science and conference proceeding citation index social science and humanities together and so let me tell you that if you want to communicate any research papers to international conference proceedings it's better you first check whether it is indexed in cpcis if it is indexed you can uh, you can send it because you will get uh, good uh, your paper will get very good visibility and will get uh, honor from the society also 
So, uh, so make sure that the research papers communicated to the conference proceedings, uh, our international conference proceedings are actually indexed in CPCIS or CPCA SSH. So these are another two products of Clarivate Analytics. Now coming to this open access journals, this is also an indexing site. We call it as the DOAJ, that is the directory of open access journals. We call it as DOAJ. And you know, um, open access journals uh, are very popular nowadays because even the topmost publishers are also, uh, also started, uh, uh, I mean, also started of open access journals. Uh, and, uh, under different new titles. The reason is many of the research scholars around the world are now preferring open access journals. Uh, so that uh, the, the research scholars uh, who are doing research at different parts of the world can freely download this uh, research papers. So as far as from the researcher's point of view, it is very good. If, if a paper is published as open access, then anyone can download this paper free of cost and they can use it in their research. And let me tell you that European funding agency, they've already, I think you might have read in the newspaper that uh, a European funding agency has very clearly uh, mentioned that whatever research projects that they sanction under the funding agency uh, and the papers that are published as part of that project should be published as open access only. Uh, see the, the uh, very good decision taken by the European uh, funding agency. They have, they have very clearly mentioned that any research papers published as part of that project should be um, published as open access paper. Uh, so, uh, so from the funding, they can use the amount for publishing it as open access because most of the leading publishers, uh, they charge for uh, publishing a paper as open access. If you don't, uh, if you're not ready to pay the money, you can publish it as, as normal conventional um, um, uh, style. That means you can give the copyright to them and proprietary uh, power. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, this can be priorities can be given to uh, the publishers and the publishers will have the full right on their paper and uh, they will charge for that paper. But if you are if you are requesting the publishers that I want to publish this open access, then you have to give some compensation. So it will come around uh, $1,500 and all. So definitely it will go around the, it will come around the, more than one lakh rupees. So for most of the research scholars, it will be very difficult for them to pay this huge amount. But if, but if the funding agency allows, then definitely you can take that amount from the funded projects. And But in India, I think they have not, the DST and all other funding agency are not giving us the uh, permission to use it for uh, publishing it as open access. Maybe, maybe later they may allow us to use that amount for open access. But uh, national institutes like uh, IIT and IITs and all, if that open access journals are SCA indexed, which I've just mentioned. If those open access journals are SCA indexed, they will give money for the um, others uh, to publish it in open access. So uh, that's what I tell you. There are several open access journals which has got a uh, very high reputation now. And most of the leading publishers are also trying to start new titles under the open access policy. Uh, so DOIJ is one such directory which manages all the uh, open access journals in the world. So this is as an indexing site where you can go and see the journal list, uh, which are indexed here. But you know, one incident happened uh, when the open access policy was accepted and when a lot of open access journals were started pleasing. Uh, one problem was that uh, some people have identified some business prospects in this domain. And they have started uh, several uh, publishing units and uh, they started uh, asking the others to pay a huge amount and without any review uh, these publishers will publish their paper and and as far as the others are concerned they are not getting anything in return by paying that amount they're just simply publishing it without any review uh, so these publishers are money making uh, people uh, and they just want to cheat the others and they want to make money from them and that's the reason why uh, these journals were named as predatory journals uh, so because these journals does not do anything for the others because if you submit, it, submit the paper and if you make the payment immediately your paper will be accepted without any review and uh, this uh, happened um, uh, but i think still such journals are there and when these kinds of publishers started publishing uh, predatory journals doaj uh, un understood the consequences of this and they uh, understood that some of the journals which are indexed in DOIJ are already having this predatory journal uh, characteristics. 
So they identified uh, such journals and they removed, in 2016, they removed 3,300 journals from their list. So you can just imagine uh, if, if they're simply removing 3,300 journals at a single uh, step, uh, you can just imagine how much, what is the consequences of this. Uh, so uh, you have to be very careful when you communicate research papers to such kind of journals. Uh, and even UGC also, you might have read in the newspaper that UGC in the earlier list, they have removed around 6,500 journals from the UGC approved list. I'm not talking about this UGC care list, I'm talking about the earlier journal list. So uh, these kinds of journals have been included in these indexing sites. And now even in Scopus, uh, let me tell you, even in Scopus, some such kind of journals are there. So you have to be, have to be very uh, careful uh, when you communicate papers to such kind of uh, journals. Okay, so uh, coming to this, it's not indexing, but uh, it has the property of indexing these products uh, because the UGC Inflict Net, you are very familiar with uh, uh, information and library network. This UGC Infliptnet is maintaining a lot of websites. Uh, so you can see when you visit their website, we can see a lot of portals there. And some of the portals also has the properties of an indexing site. Uh, so I just want to mention a few. One is known as the eShoth Sindhu. This is a consortium for higher education electronic resources. So if you go uh, to this site, you can you can see uh, several universities and colleges are uh, members of this eShoth Sindhu from where you can download a lot of eBooks um, and um, uh, 10,000 plus uh, journals you can um, uh, download and more than 30 lakh ebooks are available there. Uh, so it will be very useful for the teachers and students if they become a member of this eShoth Sindhu. Uh, and you can, you can download a lot of resources from uh, here, especially during this pandemic situation. They're all looking for the electronic resources for the learning and teaching. And I think this will be the best uh, site they can go through and uh, download the textbooks as well as um, and the uh, journals, uh, journal papers and ebooks. And this, this actually enlist is now a part of eShoth Sindhu, but I'm just putting it in the uh, in the PPT because you, some of you might be uh, knowing more about enlist. Now enlist is has become part of eShoth Sindhu. And so enlist is nothing but it's again managed by Infliptnet. It is National Library and Information Services infrastructure for scholarly content. And here also they maintain um, uh, a number of online uh, books and uh, journals. So those are interested, they can either visit Enlist here or you can go to eShoth Sindhu. So all these uh, electronic documents are available in eShoth Sindhu also. So you can visit there. And Nimbus is another website uh, which you can use for downloading open access papers. So University of Kerala is a member of this. Uh, um, QSAT is also, I think, a member. I've not used Nimbus by using the QSAT ID. I've used Nimbus by using my Kerala University ID. So Nimbus is one site uh, which gives uh, which gives the facility to search for the documents which are published as open access, which are published under the open access policy. So all the uh, papers, research papers, published in open access journals can be accessed from this Nimbus. And this is actually supported by the DOIJ indexing uh, repository. So this is a web-based document search facility through which we can access um, uh, the open access research papers. The advantage is that if you have the login ID, you can sit at home and download it because uh, in the case of uh, other proprietary kind of journals, the problem is that uh, you, sometimes you have to go to the university department or you have to go to the college where you have access to those sites because they will be using this IP address for checking whether it is coming from the uh, recognized um, uh, institutions. Uh, then only you can download those papers. But in the case of Nimbus, if you have the login ID, you can download the papers uh, by sitting at home also, because we are downloading the papers uh, from open access journals. So this is only a document search facility given by the Nimbus. Nimbus means knowledge cloud, that's the meaning of it. So this is how uh, the interface will look like. And another indexing site you can see is the Shodh Ganga. I think you might have heard about this. It's known as the Indian Electronic Thesis and Dissertations, IATD, which was started as part of the UGC regulation 2009. And now uh, I think almost um, 2,69,860 uh, theses has been uploaded here. And 440 universities are contributing to this. And Mahatma Gandhi University, Kote, is the first university to implement uh, this digital repository as part of uh, this short uh, They have utilized the funding given by the UGC for this short Ganga project. And that is the first university in India uh, uh, to support this project. And I'm extremely happy uh, that um, all the thesis uh, submitted by 
uh, there is a scholars at various universities are now available uh, free of cost at uh, this particular uh, portal and uh, so in that sense we can say it's an indexing site of electronic dissertation and uh, thesis and um, uh, let me tell you that uh, i don't know how many of you have read the new regulation uh, 2016 psg regulation as per the 2016 psg regulation uh, a candidate who have completed their phd degree shall not be uh, given the provisional degree certificate or degree certificate unless they are uh, so unless the soft copy of the thesis has been uploaded in the shopping uh, website uh, that is the um, uh, that's a very important clause included in the 2016 regulation and uh, i don't know how many universities are strictly following that so as per the rule only uh, after uploading the soft copy of the thesis in the shodhganga site the candidate which should be given uh, the degree certificate or the provisional degree certificate so that is the that's the what the rule says and also uh, you know that most of the people have a confusion about the plagiarism issues related to shodhganga let me tell you that uh, the shodhganga repository or the uh, infinitnet they will never take any action against uh, the plagiarism in case if they come across uh, the plagiarism issue of any of the PhD thesis, they will inform it to the degree awarding university. So it is the responsibility of the degree awarding universities to take stringent action against that candidate based on the statutes, uh, university statutes. So, um, so all the universities in the state has to take, uh, um, I mean, has to frame stringent regulations as part of the PhD program, and they should have regulations to deal with the plagiarism. And later, UGC itself has released a plagiarism. Uh, regulation and I will show that uh, in the slide. Uh, so now uh, every university uh, can follow that regulation. So now UGC itself has released the regulation. Uh, so now the university is very easy for the universities to follow it. So the, as far as the research scholars are concerned, this website is very important. You can go and uh, read the thesis from uh, of various subjects here. And uh, since I talked about plagiarism, I'm, I don't I don't want to explain a lot about uh, plagiarism. I, very quickly, I will just mention the consequences of this plagiarism. And even plagiarism definition and all, I think all of you are very familiar with. Uh, the, um, even some people have asked about whether the self-plagiarism is okay or not. Let me tell you that as, a, as soon as you transfer the copyright to a publisher, uh, you are not supposed to copy uh, the content from that paper. Even if it is, if, even if you are going to communicate a related paper to other journal, uh, you have to get permission from the concerned um, uh, journal where you have submitted your paper, or you have to put the reference properly. And you are not supposed to copy the paragraphs as such from an earlier uh, published paper. So even self plagiarism is also an act of uh, plagiarism. You cannot escape from that. So most of the people have a misunderstanding that since I have published that paper, I have the full right to copy the paragraphs from that uh, document. No. It's self plagiarism is also an act of uh, plagiarism. Uh, so uh, let me tell you one important uh, uh, result, which was published in an open access journal named PLOS One, which is very popular among uh, uh, the biomedical field and all PLOS One, the science field, the PLOS One. And this is one uh, paper um, uh, where they have compared German and Slovene students, and uh, I, and I think it's applicable to all people. Uh, all over the world. I think it is applicable to people all over the world. Um, uh, the findings I have just uh, highlighted here, it says that the major finding of this research revealed that easy access to information and communication technologies, ICT, and the web is the main reason driving plagiarism. I think you also agree with that because since we, since all the information, all, all the resources are readily available with a few clicks, um, uh, the, uh, the people have it, there is a good chance that people may copy the content from it as such and they have from the study from the research study itself uh, it has been revealed that it's because of this ict advancement and the web uh, that is actually driving uh, towards this uh, plagiarism so you have to be very uh, careful while you uh, while you copy the content or while you refer a particular uh, search paper so you have to be very careful um, so and you know uh, Certain uh, in certain cases, you know, uh, people feel that okay, if I do the paraphrasing and cheat the softwares that will be used by the various publishers, um, then I can publish papers in top journals. Let me tell you that around 127 papers have been retracted very recently for image duplication and data manipulation. Uh, you may be surprised. 
um, uh, because uh, it happened uh, this this came uh, in 2019 as a, a report and um, 2018 alone itself uh, you can see a lot of papers have been retracted and this this uh, these papers have been retracted mainly for the image duplication and the manipulation so even uh, the, uh, the the editorial office um, are very uh, critical in such cases and they they uh, they evaluate the paper if such complaints are coming and they will immediately retract uh, the paper and let me tell you that the retraction notice uh, will be there forever so if your paper gets retracted that retraction notice will be there forever and uh, everyone uh, can come and uh, see this retraction notice so uh, so it's better we avoid that um, so this is one such kind of retraction notice this, this is i'm just giving uh, uh, one a document which has been retracted to show how it looks like it's a document which has been retracted in a renewable and sustainable energy reviews journal so anybody who comes and um, try to access this paper they will get an information like this which says that uh, this uh, article has been retracted uh, at the request of the editor in chief because the authors have plagiarized part of a paper that have already appeared in journal and another journal so those details are also given so this retraction notice will be given there uh, which anyone can come and see it uh, so it's better uh, you always uh, be cautious about such kind of uh, things so it's better you don't do such kind of unethical uh, practices right uh, so i am not just going to the detailed discussion of, about this so there are several types of plagiarism since i'm not going to maybe some other time we can talk about it and one important thing that i would like to mention is that uh, as part of this plagiarism uh, researchers uh, will never think creatively the originality in the research will be lost quality will be lost and also main important aspect is the trust that's very important in research domain the trust in the author will be lost so it's very difficult uh, for the research scholars uh, to publish papers after getting caught uh, red handed uh, for the plagiarism it's very difficult to publish papers uh, after that so and let me tell you one important product which is published by ieee and that product is known as a prohibited authors list database uh, they maintain the names of those authors who are plagiarizing the content and they maintain this list and that list name is known as prohibited authors list and this list will be given to all the editorial offices of various journals published by ieee and depending upon the intensity of the plagiarism uh, the authors will be banned for uh, publishing papers from ieee publishers for 3 years 5 years 10 years depending on the intensity of the plagiarism and this list will be also be communicated to all the conference chairs um, uh, because uh, ieee will be supporting the conference so they will send this list to the conference chairs and the conference chairs have to go through this list and make sure that none of the authors who have submitted papers to that conference is included in this uh, prohibited authors list database if any of the authors have been included in this authors list database their paper has to be immediately rejected so they also maintain a prohibited authors list database and this is how it look like we can see the name email and the name of the university or the affiliation and also the start date and end date of the uh, prohibited uh, prohibition of uh, the authors so uh, you have to be very careful they are tracking all these incidents and they also maintain such records uh, so uh, it's better we don't follow such kind of unethical uh, practices and let me show one another um, uh, uh, an apology a letter related to the plagiarism which is written by uh, the bharat ratna sena rao uh, because you know that uh, the, uh, one of the Professor Scholars of Sena Rao has copied a one one small paragraph from a different journal, and uh, it has been informed by the uh, publishers, and it has been resolved. Uh, this issue has been resolved. But Sena Rao said this is also a case of plagiarism. So I will write an apology uh, letter to the journal. So uh, he wrote an apology letter to that one letter for copying the small paragraph from a journal. It was a mistake made by her by his research scholar. So he wrote a letter. and you can see here it is written that the corresponding authors regret the reproduction of text from an article that appeared in applied physics letters uh, in their paper so they have uh, given that small apology uh, letter also so that shows uh, how much uh, importance uh, that uh, research is giving to such kind of issues so i should we all should respect uh, the professor cnr rao for 
for writing such an apology letter. So even if it was resolved by the publishers, there is no need to write this apology letter because that issue was resolved. But still, he said uh, it was a mistake, so I should write an apology. And he wrote an apology letter to the uh, editorial office. Okay. And these are the several softwares that is used for checking the plagiarism. And the top two um, uh, products, the Identicate and Turnitin, is the most widely used uh, plagiarism checking software, which is used by even the top publishers. So when you submit a research paper to the publishers, they use these kind of their products, Identicate and Turnitin, for uh, checking whether your paper has any plagiarized content or not. And there are other other uh, plagiarism checking softwares too, but the problem is I'm not sure whether these, even the Urkund, even the Urkund uh, software, which is recommended by the UGC, I'm not sure whether these all these uh, plagiarism checking software uh, covers this comprehensive database list. Because the Identicate Alternative covers most of the repositories, so they, they they can very easily find out the plagiarized content because they cover all the uh, important repositories. But I'm not sure the other softwares are covering all the repositories. In such case, they will miss certain documents, so it will show a lesser similarity compared to the Identicate and uh, Turnitin. Because very recently in Kanduri University, one incident happened. One of the theses has was compared with Urkund, and it shown only. 10 to 12 percentage of similarity, but when they checked with, when one candidate checked that thesis with the identical alternative, uh, there was a similarity of around the 55 to 60 percentage. So you can just imagine how much difference it shows. Uh, so you have to be very careful when you use these kinds of softwares. All the standard publishers, they use identical alternative uh, softwares for checking the plagiarism because of the, uh, because we can rely on these softwares because they give very accurate uh, research. And I told you about the predatory journals, right? Um, I already given the definition of predatory because it, these predatory journals uh, you have to be very careful because they take advantage of the others by asking them to publish a fee uh, publish for a fee without providing any peer review or editing services. Such journals uh, are very uh, you have to be very careful. You should never send any papers to such kind of journal. And uh, when you compare these predatory journals versus open access journals, the goal of open access is very clear. It is it is mainly for disseminating the research. Um, uh, output to a larger audience by removing uh, the requirement of paying a huge amount. And um, open access journals may ask uh, the authors to uh, pay an amount only for the peer review and editing. And open access journals will be indexed in most of the top indexing sites and they also have impact factors. So predatory journals will never have these kind of characteristics. So you have to be very careful when you communicate papers to the predatory journals. And it was this, this predatory concept, uh, predatory journal concept was first introduced by uh, the Professor uh, Jeffrey Beal from the University of Colorado. Uh, earlier, he used to write a blog, but now uh, he's stopped writing the blog, maybe because of the threat uh, he's getting from various publishers. Now he has stopped writing the blog. But, uh, but some um, uh, readers of that blog, they have prepared that because not, now the Beal's list is not there. Earlier, he used to manage a list known as Beal's list of predatory journals. Uh, but now he is not writing that blog. But some of the readers have created the deals list and they have, they have uploaded in a very in a different domain. So that site is given there, bealslist.bibli.com or bealslist.net. If you go there, you can see all the um, uh, predatory uh, publishing, uh, predatory publishers and predatory journals here. Now, if you look at there are several categories shown under this. One is known as the publishers, that is the uh, predatory publishers uh, who actually publish papers without any peer review. Then we have standalone journals list because standalone journal means they don't have any publisher. The name of the journal itself is the publisher name. So we call such journals as standalone journals. Then another is very important one, Vanity Press. Vanity Press means if you look at that uh, journal website, you may feel that they are very genuine, but actually they are not uh, genuine because they are the procedures and everything. If you look at it, it will be almost similar to uh, the, uh, the original uh, or the uh, non-predatory kind of journals but uh, but if you go into the details of it you can see that they are asking money and they are asking uh, they are giving reviews very um, not uh, up to the standard uh, the, the, the kind of reviews that we normally get in top journals so uh, we say that it's uh, such journals are again a kind of we cannot say it's they are fully predatory a kind of uh, predatory journals and uh, they have maintained a separate list for that journal that is known as the vanity press and we have hijacked journals Hijacked journals means uh, some publishers, they will start the journal with a name very popular among the uh, research scholars because uh, they will just copy the name of one popular journal. 
for example if there is a journal named signal processing uh, published by elsevier so suppose i am going to start a, a new journal i will give the name signal processing and i may give some kind of same look and feel for that uh, journal and even the website may also look like a uh, similar one such journals are known as hijack journals so, so the authors may may get confused which one is the original one so they may submit it to a wrong uh, journal so this has happened uh, uh, and I, I even know certain incidents personally so uh, some of uh, the students of my professor um, have faced that uh, so uh, so you have to be very careful uh, the hijacked journals don't send the journals to the uh, sorry papers to the hijacked journals you will be uh, cheated then misleading metrics very important one because i have seen some um, uh, research scholars coming and telling that, see, I have published a paper in a journal with impact factor 7.5. So when I look at the journal, it started only one year back. And how this journal is getting 7.5 impact factor. So when I closely look into that metric, it will be known as, it's not impact factor, it might be written something like impact index 7.5. And this candidate might have misunderstood it as impact factor. So there are certain misleading metrics which are already shown in the certain uh, journals homepage. Uh, which is actually misleading it uh, those values are really misleading and people may feel that this is the real impact factor actually the impact factor is released by uh, as part of one important document known as journal citation report jcr again by clarivate analytics that is the only accepted impact factor value all over the world and another one is the, um, the uh, site score value which is actually published by elsevier so only uh, elsevier and clarivate analytics are publishing um, accepted uh, impact factor values, but all other are misleading metrics. So you have to be very careful when you when you when you see this misleading metrics values. So all the misleading uh, metric list is given there, like index Copernicus value, impact index, research index. Like a lot of misleading metrics are there. So you can just go and see uh, that link. Um, so this this list is still maintained. Uh, so those who want to see whether uh, whether the journal or publisher is included in this predatory list, you can just go through this list. And if it is included, please don't send papers to those uh, journals. So you have to be very cautious. This is how it looks like. Uh, wheels list of predatory journals and publishers. We can scroll down and you can see all the list by visiting this site. Uh, this is the predatory standalone journals, Vanity Press. And this is the hijacked journals list, which has the same name as the original authentic uh, journal. Uh, they, they use the name of the authentic journal. Uh, for their journal and such journals are known as the hijacked predatory journal and these are the misleading metrics i'm talking about global impact factor general impact factor uh, uh, directory of journal quality factor site factor like that they use several names for uh, this these are all misleading metrics okay so here i think who who is actually managing the blog it's not very clear but uh, it's very clearly written here that he is not jeffrey b so it's, it's, you know, Jeffrey Bill is not managing this blog, I'm sure. So the, the author itself has very clearly mentioned here. And Jeffrey Bill has written an article also in Biochemica Medica Journal, where he has very clearly uh, uh, mentioned about the problems that he had faced when he started that blog. So that's the name of the title. The title of this paper is What I Learned from Predatory Publishers by Jeffrey Bill. Uh, so uh, if you're interested, you can just go through it. So you can just see what all uh, problems he has faced when he was managing that blog. Uh, okay. So this is about the uh, regulation I was talking about, UGC regulation um, related to the plagiarism. It's the promotion of academic integrity and prevention of plagiarism in higher educational institutions, regulation 2018. And there uh, very clearly uh, they have mentioned the levels of plagiarism. You can see that level zero, one, two, and three. Level zero is similarities up to 10 percentage. Level one is similarities above 10 to 40 percentage. Level two, 40 to 60. And level three means similarities above uh, 60. And um, in, in these cases, the penalty is also very clearly mentioned, like uh, sometimes submitting a revised manuscript or revised thesis within a stipulated time, and sometimes canceling the registration of that candidate if it is above 60 percentage. So all the penalties are also very clearly given here. And even the penalties for the supervisor is also given. Uh, because uh, so sometimes if the similarity is very high, the supervisor will now be allowed to supervise an MPhil or PhD student for a period of three years. Uh, so all those penalty has all been has also been very clearly mentioned uh, in this regulation. So when you get time, all of you please go through these regulations. It can be downloaded from the UGC uh, website. Okay. So now we are going to the scientometrics section. So before that, 
uh, if there is any clarification required related to the journal indexing you can ask it now so that we can move on to the next uh, topic so we'll take maybe five minutes break will, will be that okay So can we take five minutes break? Is it is it middle listening to I me, mean, uh, Dr. Anu or Dr. Dipya? Anyone listening to me? Uh, can, can I? Can I? Can we take so a five minutes? Uh, so you can carry on. We can have the questions in the end. Okay. Like all the questions. That's what we've been doing for all these days. So we can have the questions in the end. At the end. Okay. So I thought if there is any any uh, clarification regarding indexing, I thought I can ask now. Okay, fine. I will continue. No problem. Okay, so um, we will come to uh, the next important uh, section or the second part of uh, this session that is uh, uh, the scientometrics. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, as far as uh, the productivity of a research scholar uh, is concerned, it's very important that we have to, uh, we have to see how uh, how much quality works he or she is uh, producing and uh, as far as the journal is concerned we should also know uh, whether this journal is a good or quality journal to be communicated so fortunately we have certain metric values which can be used for assessing the quality of the journals and that branch uh, of bibliometrics where we use the uh, mathematical uh, terms or mathematical uh, formulas for computing uh, the productivity of a journal or the productivity of the quality of a journal or the productivity of research that branch is known as the uh, scientometrics and in the sign under scientometrics we have two uh, branches one is known as the author level scientometrics and the other is the journal level uh, metric values or journal level uh, metrics so first we will see the very uh, commonly used uh, journal level metric or scientometric which is known as the journal impact factor and here uh, I've given an example here and arbitrarily I have taken a year uh, 2008 impact factor which is, give, which is given as a ratio A by B. So impact factor is nothing but a simple ratio A by B where the numerator A is nothing but the number of times the article is published in 2006 and 7 were cited by index journal. See this, uh, the word is very important, indexed. That's the reason why we discussed about the indexing sites like SCI, Web of Science, and Scopus and all. So Scopus, if I say it's a Scopus metric, they will be using the Scopus index journals. If I say journal citation report, it, they will be using Web of Science. So depending upon the product, the indexing site that they use will be different. So that's why I, uh, I we discussed about the indexing, journal indexing at the, at the first session. Uh, so the numerator shows how many times the articles published in six and seven 2006 and seven were cited by indexed journals during 2008 and that is the 2000 um, that is the numerator part of the uh, impact factor a by b so here you can see that um, we have three years given here six seven and eight so 2006 and seven is known as the uh, target period that means we are looking at the citations uh, received for those papers which are published in 
during the target period six and seven. So we have uh, one as the one um, period is known as the target period, and the other is known as the census period. So the, the, in the case of uh, impact factor, the target period is two years. That is year it is two thousand six and seven, and the census period. You know what is meant by census, right? We are just looking at. Uh, how many times uh, these papers have got citations? It's like a census. So the census period is one year. That is 2008. So 2006 census, the papers published in 2006 and 7, the target period. Um, uh, we will look at how many times those articles have received citation during the year 2008. That is the census period. So that forms the uh, numerator part. And the denominator, you can see that the total number of citable items in 6 and 7. Uh, so when I say citable items means that is very important. So if you look at the uh, if you look at the journals, you can see that in addition to the research papers, uh, these journals also publishes certain other documents, and all those documents also have DOI numbers. So if you look at uh, a journal, uh, it will have research papers which have DOI numbers, and in addition to the research papers, they also publish other uh, documents which also have DOI numbers. For example, table of contents. Uh, sometimes uh, like. Uh, an editorial, uh, sorry, uh, M, not editorial, sorry, a message from um, editor in chief. Uh, how to, the manuscript submission procedure. So these are all different uh, documents um, uh, that will also be published as part of the research papers. But these are not citable items. So that should be avoided. So that's what uh, here we say B is the total number of citable items in 2006 and. Seven. So if that uh, non-citable items is also in included, since it is in the denominator, uh, the impact factor will get uh, decreased. So we have to remove all the uh, non-citable items, only the citable items should be taken into consideration. So A by B means, A means number of citations, B means number of citable items or number of articles. So what does it mean? It's, it's nothing but an average value. And what is that average value indicates? On an average, how many times a paper published in that journal will be cited? That is the meaning of it. For example, suppose a journal has got an impact factor of 4.7. What does it mean? A research paper published in that journal will be cited 4.7 times on an average. That's the meaning. Practically, 4.7 times is not possible because only integer uh, values can be given, but this is an average value. It's, it's, it simply means that on an average, uh, this paper, a paper published in this journal will be uh, cited 4.7 times. So higher the impact factor means, the higher will be the, the quality of the journal. That's what it means. And this is how it is shown because, see, let me tell you that these impact factor values are actually uh, published by uh, um, this Clarivate Analytics in the form of a product known as Journal Citation Report, JCR, Journal citation report. Now we have uh, 2019 JCR uh, uh, being used now, uh, which shows the 2018 impact factor. Now, uh, this year, uh, 2020, 2020 JCR will be released soon, which will show the 2019 impact factor. Uh, so um, uh, you, can, you, can, you can just wait for that maybe in the next month or maybe in July, you can uh, see the impact factors being changed. Uh, because uh, they will release the uh, 2019 impact factor as part of the 2020 JCR. Uh, so this is the only acceptable document in the world as far as the impact factor is concerned. Uh, so they use the um, Web of Science index journals only for computing the uh, impact factors, uh, right? And that product is also very costly. I also, sometimes I will not be able to download that. So what I do is I will get it uh, from my friend working in other institutions, national institutions or outside India. So they uh, communicate it to me so that I can, uh, it's a very, it's a costly uh, document. And uh, in some journals, some top journals, they published certain metrics which are mentioned in the JCR in their homepage. So JCR is actually a document which shows uh, several metric values. It's not, it's not showing only the impact factor. Let me tell you that because some people have a misunderstanding that JCR uh, shows only the impact factor value. No, JCR shows uh, impact factor and also several other metric values. So it's actually for a, for as far as a single journal is concerned, as far as a particular journal is concerned, it will have several metric values and impact factor is only one among them. Uh, so some journals, uh, what they do is some publishers, they will pick certain metrics and they will show it in their homepage. That we can see free of cost. But if you want to see the complete metric values of the uh, journal, then you have to depend on the JCR uh, report. So JCR is a very comprehensive report where you can see that for every journal, we have a set of metric values. 
Okay, so we can we can see that if you download the document. But if you go through the certain standard uh, publishers, there the, the, in the home page of the journal published by standard publishers, they might have given certain values. Mostly they give the impact factor only. But certain journals they give more than uh, they they may also show other metric values. Uh, I will show it one by one. So this is the home page of a journal published by Springer. And now we can see that here you can see that it shows an impact factor here, right? One point eight nine four based on the 2019 JCR report, 1.894. So it's a two year impair factor, which means that they have taken uh, the target period as two years and census period as uh, one year. But look at uh, this uh, one uh, five year impair factor. It's also a, another metric value shown in the JCR report. Five year impair factor means uh, uh, the formula is exactly the same. The only difference is that the target period is five years and the census period is only one year. So as far as the census period is concerned, it's the same, but the target period is only two for the normal impact factor. And uh, for five year impact factor, the target period is five years. Uh, so if you, if you look at this uh, five year impact factor is 1.896 and this is 1.894, there is a slight difference. So if this two year impact factor is low compared to the five year, it means that now the performance is not up to the mark. But if it is higher than the five-year impact factor, it means that uh, it's, the journal is improving their impact factor. That is the meaning of it. Therefore, the Elsevier journal, you can see that this is the home page. But since I cannot include the complete uh, page in, the, in a single slide, I have shown only the portion of it. So here, you know, on the bottom left, they show the uh, impact factor values. I will show in the next slide. So this is how it looks like. In, at this part, you can see the impact factor. That's what I'm showing here. This is what I was talking about. In the bottom left, you can see uh, the journal metric values. It's a continuation of this page. Uh, so here you can see that they are giving impact factor 4.086. And it also shows five year impact factor, which was shown in the case of Springer publishers. But the other three metrics you look at, site score 4.73, SNIP, SciMago journal ranking, SJR. These three uh, scientometrics are not part of the JCR. These three scientometrics are part of Elsevier report. It's not based on the JCR. These three metric values are managed by Elsevier and these values are computed based on the Scopus database and not based on the Web of Science. So site score, uh, the, the site score, uh, the SNIP and SJR are calculated based on the Scopus database by Elsevier. And these two we will discuss later. The site score I can very quickly, very easily I can explain because it is exactly the same as in that factor. The only difference is that the target period is three years. Um, because um, the normal impact factor uses two years as the target period and five year impact factor uses five years as a target period. Site score uses only uh, three years as the, uses three years as the impact factor because through the, there is one research paper published by Elsevier well, Research Group that said that the target period three is the best to represent the good citation track record of the journals. So they, they proved it through various mathematical uh, concepts. So uh, they use three years uh, as the uh, target period here. So otherwise, the formula and all are exactly the same. But another difference is that these two are impact factor and fire impact factor are calculated based on Web of Science, where a site score is calculated based on the Scopus database. That is the difference. Now coming to the IEEE journals, they show impact factor, it's a, which is a two-year impact factor. They are not showing five-year impact factor here, but it's already there in the JCR. For this journal also, five-year impact factor is there. It is there in JCR, but it is not shown in the home page. That's up to the publisher. Publisher is not showing that. That's a now they are showing two other uh, metric values, which are very important. That is the Eigen factor and the article influence score. These two are metrics are there in the JCR. It is actually again um, uh, used by, uh, sorry, calculated based on the Web of Science database. And Eigen factor and article influence score are two different metrics um, included in the journal uh, citation uh, report. Um, so I will uh, I will talk about this Eigen factor and article influence score uh, later if I get time. Uh, so uh, coming to the so that is about uh, the journal level metric that is the impact factor. Now we will see two metrics, two important metrics, which is actually um, calculated at the author level, uh, which is actually used to quantify an individual scientific research output. And uh, one such popular uh, uh, metric is the H index, also also known as the Hirsch index which is proposed by George e. Hirsch, a physicist from University of California. And he published it in uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, USA in 2005. 
so um, the the definition of the h index is uh, very clearly given here so i request all the participants to just go through this definition so that i can explain that with the help of an example so first you uh, just uh, read this uh, definition and then we'll uh, see how it can be done with the help of an example a scientist has h index h if each of his papers have a batch of his np np is the total number of papers published by that author have at least h citations each and np and the remaining papers and the remaining papers means np minus h papers are at most h uh, citations so a scientist has index h index value h index value h if h of his total number of papers published np if h of his np papers are at least h citations each and the remaining papers are at most Uh, at citations so i think uh, we will uh, do that with the help of an uh, um, example uh, so we can take one example here so uh, suppose we have a, a, um, a researcher let uh, uh, it be a researcher r1 is there and i am uh, assume that he has published around uh, uh, 10 papers and let it be let the citations be uh, uh, written in descending order uh, like this uh, maybe 10 then 8 then 8 then 6 and 6 4 so uh, let uh, uh, let us assume that there is a research scholar r1 who has published around 10 papers and out of these 10 papers this is these are the citation patterns that he has received uh, for the one paper for the first paper 10 citations then 8 then 8 then 6 6 4 4 3 3 2 now if you look at uh, the definition uh, and uh, and see how we can compute that index now uh, we'll start from the first paper for, uh, itself so if you look at uh, we can say that it, uh, this author has got h index value 1 um it's exactly true h index can be 1 because one paper has got uh, one citation and the remaining papers have got at least one citation so it is true uh, now we can see whether it has got we have to find out the highest possible h index value that's what we are trying to find now let it be 2 so out of this np papers np means out of 10 papers two papers have got at least two citations and the remaining papers have got uh, at least at most uh, sorry at most two citations so h index can be 2 now we look at 3 whether it uh, the value 3 is possible three papers have got at least three citations and the remaining papers have got at most three citations that is true so it can be h index value 4 sorry 3 h, h, h index can be 3 also now we look at the four papers h index equal to 4 so our four papers out of this 10 papers have at least four citations and the remaining papers have at most four citations right so here also h index 4 is possible now we will look at the five 1 2 3 4 5 5 five papers have got at least five citations and the remaining papers have got at most five citations so h index 5 is possible now we look at 6 1 2 3 4 5 6 six papers should have at least six citations that is not there because one paper has only four citations so h index 6 is not possible so you can say that so you can say that out of uh, can say that the uh, up to this you can say that all papers have uh, greater than or equal to uh, five right a citation greater than or equal to five and if you look at the remaining one uh, the remaining one is less than or equal to 5 uh, so you can say that for this research scholar uh, the h index value is equal to 5 uh, so h index value will be 5 so uh, at least uh, so, uh, so as per the definition you can see five out of 10 papers have at least five citations and the remaining five papers are at most five citations which is satisfied here 
right now if this particular uh, researcher r1 if if he wants to get an h index value 6 the the change that is required is like this see practically we not get change like this it depends on how who all cite your paper for for the understanding purpose i'm just changing the citation value here uh, so maybe i can say suppose this this, this particular value 4 is actually changed to uh, maybe Uh, this 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 particular value four, I am changing it to. Uh, suppose I am changing it to six. So what will happen? One, two, three, four, five, six, right? Up to here. Up to here, all the papers have um, citations uh, greater than or equal to six, and the remaining uh, papers will have uh, citations less than or equal to six. And here, all papers have values. Uh, greater than or equal to uh, six. So we can say that if this change is occurring, uh, then the R one will have an H index value of uh, five. So not five. Uh, sorry, uh, six. H index value of six. So out of these ten papers, six papers have got at least six citations, and the remaining papers have got at most uh, six citations. So this is how uh, this H index value is actually uh, calculated, and uh, uh, and we'll see how uh, the other. Now I will just give one more example, so that I can explain it and then go. Uh, I hope it is clear. So I am just rubbing this. Now assume that we have uh, two researchers, R one and R two. R1 and R1 has got uh, published four papers and he has got citations like this. Somehow he managed to get four citations each for that paper. So altogether, how many uh, total? How many citations? Sixteen uh, citations and H index value is four because all the four papers have at least four citations and the remaining have at most four. So here, uh, practically. Uh, Uh, the h index value will be 4 and let me tell you that a, a research scholar can get an h index value maximum h index value equal to the number of publications so in the previous example r1 has published 10 papers so uh, theoretically we can say that r1 can achieve maximum h index of uh, 10 because if all the 10 papers have got more than 10 citations its h index will become 10 So that is the uh, theoretical um, uh, limit for, uh, the, but practically to get it is very difficult. Uh, it depends on how uh, it depends on the quality of your research paper. The citation pattern depends on that. So theoretically, you can say that you can have an H index value maximum up to um, the number of papers published. So here in this example, R1 um, has R1 has got uh, four papers published and is somehow managed to get 16 citations, adding uh, getting four to each paper and the H index is four. Now assume that we have. Another um, uh, researcher, uh, another researcher, uh, R two, and R two has got citation like this, uh, maybe hundred, uh, then eighty, then uh, maybe ten, then maybe five. So if you look at, uh, he has got total of. One ninety-five citations, and here also, if you look at, he has published only four papers, and H index value will be four, because four papers have got at least four citations, and the remaining papers have at most four. So both the cases, R one and R two, will have H index value four. Now you just look at the citation pattern. This R one will claim that I have got an H index value four, and R two will also claim that I have got H index value four, but. Whether they are comparable, I am sure that you will never say that these R1 and R2 are comparable. Why? Because R1 was able to get only 16 total citations, and R2 has got total citations of 195, which means that all the four papers he has published are good papers, especially the first two papers, because he got 180 citations from those two papers, which may be a classic paper. But whereas R1 research papers are concerned. it may not it may be because some, there are several factors for that but for the time being we assume that he is not getting good citations uh, for the papers published uh, i'm talking about r1 
R1 is not getting good citations for the four papers published. So we cannot compare R1 and R2 just looking at H index value. So in such cases, we need to go uh, through the citations, total citations received uh, here. And fortunately, we have one measure known as, that measure is known as uh, E index. E index, which is known as the excess index. Uh, excess value, the excess value that you are uh, received as part of the uh, citation, that is known as the E index or excess uh, index. Uh, so what it uh, gives is that um, this E index value, how it can be computed, it will be like this. If you look at uh, uh, this particular pattern, we know that both of them have H index value four, right? So we will just look at the minimum number of citations required for getting H index value four. We know that that is nothing but 16 nothing but four squared. If it is five, it is 25. If it is six, it is 36. That is the minimum number required for getting that H index value. So we know that for H index four, the minimum number of values that you want to get is uh, 16. So what we do is we will subtract the minimum required value 16 from the total citations received by these two scholars. So from R1, I will subtract this 16. I, I'm going to subtract this value 16 from this particular value. So what will happen uh, when you subtract this 16, the value will become zero. So it's E index value will be zero here. And what happens here? Here you can see that I'm going to subtract uh, 16 from here. So we get around uh, nine, then, uh, then seven, then one. So we are getting 179 as the uh, remaining value. And we'll just take the square root of this 179. So we take uh, the 179 square root of this to have the comparative performance with H index. So that value will be the E index value. So whenever we have two research scholars having the same H index value, if you want to compare their performance, you can take the excess index value. How many excess citations they've got in addition to the uh, minimum required value of 16. In this case, it is 16 because H index value is four. So the minimum is 16. So you subtract that 16 from the total citations of the both the scholars and remaining you take the square root and then you compare so that you can have an idea about who has really contributed uh, well to the uh, research uh, works. So this is how E index is calculated. So uh, whenever two scholars having the same H index value, um, you should always think about such kind of additional metrics to assess their uh, productivity. So one such metrics is the um, uh, E index uh, value. I hope it is clear. So H index, uh, it's very clear. So sometimes two scholars will have the same H index value. In such cases, you can go for uh, E index uh, value. Just subtract the minimum required uh, value from the total number of uh, citations and take the score root. That will give you the excess index. So coming back to this uh, presentation. Now, uh, this is about H index and E index. So we have one more index known as the G index. Uh, this, this is actually uh, an index proposed by uh, Leo AG. Uh, is from the University of Antwerp and Hasselt, and he published that in Scientometrics in the year 2006. And the definition is given here. There's a slight change compared to the H index value. So you can just uh, look at the definition. Given a set of articles ranked in decreasing order of the number of citations that they received, G index is the largest number such that the top G articles, the top, again, descending order, top G articles received together at least G squared, uh, citations. Uh, so we can read it once again. Given a set of articles ranked in decreasing order of the number of citations that they received, G index is the largest number such that the top G articles received together, that word is very important, together at least D squared uh, citations. So so coming back to this, uh, I will show you how this G index actually uh, works. Uh, suppose we have a, a research scholar R1. And suppose these are the citation patterns, let it be uh, 100, uh, 10, 10, 8, then 5, then 0, and 0, and 0, and 0, and 0. And zero. Suppose this is how uh, the <coughs> research scholar R1 has got the citation. He has published 10 papers. And he has got uh, uh, the citation patterns like this, 100, 10, 10, 8, 
five, then all are zeros. Now, if you look at this citation pattern and calculate the H index, what will be the H index here? Here, you know that out of these 10 papers, if you look at um, uh, the five papers have uh, got um, at least five citations and the remaining papers have got uh, at most five citations. So we can say that here, um, the H index uh, value, uh, the H index value is five. But look at the G index. Now what the G index do is, um, it will uh, write the citation uh, in the decreasing order like this. So we already written decreasing order of the citation. Now you have to see whether the G squared citations have been received by G papers together. That is uh, that is a point. Now if you look at whether G index G index value is one, which means that one paper together got at least one citation, one squared citation. So that is true. Here it here itself it is hundred citation. Let it be G index two. Two papers together, it should get four citation, G squared citation. So it is there. Now, if you look at three, uh, three papers together, it should get nine citations. Four, four papers together, 16 citations. Five, five papers together, it should get 25. Definitely from here itself, 100 is there. So 25 uh, is possible. Now you are coming to the next one, six. Six papers together, it should have 36. Already it is there. So we can include this, this paper with zero citation also in the calculation. Now next one, seven papers, 49 is there. Eight papers, 64 is there. Nine papers, 81 is there. 10 papers, 10 papers means G index value 10 means, but all together, 10 papers together should have at least 100 citations. So from one paper itself, the 100 is there. So all together, if you, if you, take, if you take all these papers together, then we say that the citation should be 10 squared, which is equal to uh, 100. So here definitely it is above 100. So we can say that this R1 has got G index value is equal to 10. So even if he is publishing uh, one more paper with zero citation, what happens, you know, uh, here it's a total value uh, citation is um, 11 papers together. It should have how many citations? 121 citation would be there. Definitely it is more than uh, 121. So its index value will become 11. So even if you are publishing papers which has not yet received any any citations, but the already um, uh, the citations which have been received by the uh, classic papers, they will contribute to this H index. Sorry, not H index, G index. So that is the advantage of G index value because we are taking the G squared value of the uh, G papers together. We just looking at the total citations together and then see whether it crosses G squared or equal to a G squared, then we'll get the G index value. So here what happened is 10 papers together, it should have uh, more than or equal to 100. So it is satisfied and you are getting G index 10. Now you can see H index is only five, but G index is 10. So we can also consider the recently published papers along with the um, top uh, cited papers uh, in order to have higher uh, G index value. So this G index has been um, used to overcome some of the, some of the limitations of uh, uh, H index value. So I hope uh, the calculation of H and G index value is clear. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, coming to this, uh, another important metric, a few more metrics I will mention then I will stop. Uh, next important metric is the uh, Eigen factor. I told you in the case of uh, IEEE, they have shown, you see here, it's, it's the Eigen factor. So I will just explain, I'm not going to the mathematical aspects of it. I'm just explaining how this Eigen factor is calculated. Uh, the concept is like this. Up to this time, <coughs> we have given equal priority to all the citations received from different journals. Suppose you are getting, uh, suppose a journal is receiving a citation from journal X and a journal is receiving a citation from journal Y. Both these uh, citations will be given equal priority, whether it is from X or Y the citation is treated as uh, equal uh, value or, or the priority is given as equal. Uh, but in the case of Eigen factor, what it does is, if a journal is receiving a citation from a top rated journal, its weight will be higher. And if the citation is from a, um, a low rated or low impact factor journal, uh, the weight will be less. So it is giving a weight value to the uh, citations. So depending on from where uh, the citation is coming, depending on that, the weight will be given. So higher weightage will be given to those citations coming from top rated journals and lower weightage will be given to those journals which are coming from the uh, low impact factor uh, values, uh, where they're coming with low impact factor values. So this is how Eigen factor is calculated. Uh, so it's actually a weighted citation pattern, you can say. 
And now uh, what they've done is they have normalized these values in such a way that when you add all these eigenfactor values together, it will count up to 100. If you add the eigenfactor values of all the journals in the JCR list, it will add up to exactly 100, which means that out of this uh, 100 um, percentage of the total scientific uh, contributions, how much is the impact of this particular journal? So how much is the uh, contribution that you have given to this particular, um, uh, how much contribution this particular journal has given to the uh, science? That's what this Aiken factor uh, indicates. Even I think for the nature journal, it's around one point something. Um, so which means that out of the total and contributions made by all fields, all journals together. I mean, all journals in various fields together, it is 100. So Eigen factor uh, indicates what is the journal's contribution to this total 100 uh, percentage of the scientific contributions. That's what Eigen factor uh, indicates. And uh, and one more, um, in order for uh, better understanding, uh, they have used a metric known as uh, normalized Eigen factor value uh, that is known as EFN normalized Eigen factor because if you look at the values, it's very difficult to understand. See this, it's 0 0.06145. It's very difficult to understand the importance of this Eigen factor. It's, it's actually a very good Eigen factor value. But from the value 0 0.06, you may feel that it's a very low value. But it's actually a contribution uh, to the total 100. What is the percentage of this uh, particular journal? That's what it shows this 0 0.06. So in order to have a better understanding, they use the a normalized Eigen factor value where uh, we assume that an average journal will have an Eigen factor value of one, which means that any journal which has got a normalized Eigen factor value above one will be an above average journal and below one means it's a below average journal. So they have made a threshold uh, like one as the average uh, normalized value, uh, sorry, the Eigen factor, uh, normalized Eigen factor value for an average journal in the JCA. And that is set as one. So all journals which has got above one value means it is better a journal and below means it's not performing well compared to the average journal. So such metric is also being used uh, in the uh, scientometric field. So it's very simple when somebody asks you what is the difference between impact factor and Eigen factor. Eigen factor is nothing but it takes care of uh, the citation pattern from where the citation comes. So it, it gives weightage to the uh, citation coming from a top rated journal and less weightage to the low impact factor journals. That's what Eigen factor does. And Eigen factor is supported by uh, Web of Science database. And I told you, you know, uh, there is another metric known as SJR. See this, Saimago Journal Rank, SJR. Saimago is a, is a, is a, a company who actually um, uh, uh, publishes uh, the journal list. Indexing is also there. And also they give a uh, ranking system known as the SJR, Saimago Journal Ranking. And SJR is exactly the same as Eigen Factor. The only difference is that SJR is supported by, or it's, up, it's actually, um, uh, uh, the calculation is based on the Scopus database, or the SJR Journal Rank computation is based on the Scopus database, whereas the Eigen Factor is based on um, uh, Web of Science database. That is the only difference. Otherwise, the calculation is almost the uh, same. Uh, and this is the site where you can just type the journal name and get the Eigen factor. That is not required because JCR already shows this Eigen factor. So that is enough. Uh, so this is how it shows. Uh, now, another important uh, indexing site related to the productivity of uh, a research, uh, uh, researcher is concerned. This is known as a pub launch. It's actually managed by Web of Science. So I request all the scholars who are attending this uh, webinar uh, try to use this Publons uh, and create a link there. Uh, earlier, it was known as the researcher ID, which was managed by Web of Science. Now it is known as the Publons. And the researcher ID can be ported to this Publons. So you can see that I just ported my researcher ID with the ID B7069-2013 has been ported to this Publons. Now, researcher ID profile is not there. All the profile has been ported to this Publons. Now you can see it shows my uh, publication document, how many documents I have published. Uh, how many times it has cited and what is the index value, how many papers I have reviewed, how many editorial services I have given, all these are uh, shown in this Publons. So it's very easy, it's free of cost. You just register in this Publons database, give your researcher ID if you already have, uh, the, otherwise you can start a new, new profile there itself. You can add your research papers to that and immediately it will calculate the citations and it will show this uh, profile which you can make it public. So uh, all of you try to uh, become a member of this Publons or register your profile in Publons. And I'm sure that in future, 
they will ask uh, this Pavlon's link uh, for recruitment purposes and also for uh, the project evaluation and for every such evaluation purposes, they may ask your Scopus and Pavlon's profile. So we'll be forced to give this Pavlon's profile and Scopus profile for the evaluation. So try to create this uh, today itself if possible. And this is the Google Scholar. If you have a Gmail ID, uh, you can very quickly uh, create this uh, Google profile, Google Scholar profile. Just log into that and uh, add all the papers belonging to you by searching uh, the journals, or you can all, always import the data. Either from Web of Science, you can import it, or you can import the data from Scopus, or you can import the data from ORCID. All those possibilities are given in the uh, Google Scholar. And once all the papers belonging to you has been imported to this, uh, 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 this Google Scholar profile, you can make the profile public. And so I have made this profile public. The advantage is that it shows uh, our name, affiliation, and even the area of specialization. And the most important aspect of this is that you can see all the papers is, is actually a web link. When you click this web link, it will go to the repository where from where you can download this paper. That is the advantage of this. It will go to the repository from where you can download that paper. And you can also see a numerical value here, which shows the number of citations that you have received for each paper. Most of the accreditation agencies, they ask for the number of the number of citations that each paper has received. So you can depend on this site and you can give the value here. So if this paper has received, uh, this particular paper has received 90 citations. And the most interesting part of this is that if you click this 90, this is a web link. When you click this 90, it will show all the papers which has cited this particular paper. So you can see which all research group has referred uh, my paper. I can just go through the 90 records and see which all research groups have referred this particular paper. Like that for every paper, I can go and see that. And on the on the uh, bottom right, on the bottom right, you can see uh, the my co-authors here. So whoever who visit this particular page, they can also see my collaborators and they can just click it and they can see the Google profile of my uh, collaborators. That is also very important. And uh, the scientometric uh, values are shown here. You can see it, three values it shows. One is the citations. The other is the H index, which I already explained. And I10 index is given as 32, which means that how many papers have got more than 10 citations. So here 32 means that out of maybe 90 research papers which are published, uh, 32 papers have got more than 10 citations. So maybe they use this 10 to indicate a paper which receives more than 10 citations. It may be a good paper, that may be the reason. So that's what this item index uh, shows. So 32 papers have got more than uh, 10 citations. And this column, in this column you can see uh, that uh, here, if you look at uh, it since 2015, um, uh, means the last five years, during the last five years, um, how many citations have received? So I can, from this column, I can uh, see what is my contribution during the last five. If the, here, if the values are very less, it means that I'm not contributing well during the last five years, but these values shows it's, it's an indicator about uh, uh, how much um, uh, effort I'm taking during the last five years for publishing research papers and how many citations I've received. All those values you will uh, you will get it. So that's the uh, that's the advantage of this particular column. So this is all together. The first column is all total citation I've received, and the, uh, the second column is uh, the citations received during the last uh, five years. So this profile, uh, Google profile, is very simple to create and very simple to use and understand. Uh, so try to use it uh, if possible. And I, I told you, Elsevier is managing uh, three other metrics like site score uh, and uh, this SJR and uh, SNIP. Uh, the, the, these three uh, metrics are also being used uh, widely now. Site score I've already explained. It's nothing but it's a three-year impact factor. Uh, the target period is three years. And SJR, I already told you, it is just like Eigen factor, which give weight gates to the citations received from other journals uh, because they are not considering uh, it as equal uh, weightage. If we are getting weightage from top journals, we give, uh, so if you are getting citations from top journals, we give more weightage. Otherwise, we'll give less weightage. But the only difference is that SJR is supported by uh, Scopus, whereas Eigen factor is supported by the above signs. SNIP is another important metric used by uh, the Elsevier. It's known as the source normalized impact per paper. Source normalized impact per paper. I will just give an example so that you will understand the idea behind it. Uh, I'm not going to the other calculations of that. Uh, the idea is very simple. If you look at um, uh, the medical field, and there is uh, and one journal in the medical field is receiving a citation from the top rated journal in the medical field. Let it be. Uh, uh, 
cancer journal or lancet journal which is uh, are all top rated journals in the field and may let it be the impact factor may be 53 or 55 and we are getting a citation from that and in the same way in the mathematics field a journal is receiving a citation from a top rated mathematics journal and it has got an impact factor of four or five because that is the highest impact factor journal in the mathematics field now what is the difference here if you use sjr or Eigen factor you know that every time the medical field journals will have higher Eigen factor value because Eigen factor is calculated based on giving higher weightage to the top rated journal so medical related journals will always have a high impact factor so they will always get high Eigen, uh, high uh, Eigen factor value but snip what it does is they treat um, in this example if a if a journal is receiving a citation from a top rated journal in the medical field suppose it is giving a higher weightage to that the same weightage will be given to the mathematics field also when a mathematics journal is receiving a citation from a top rated journal in the mathematics field the weightage given will be exactly the same if i am giving a weightage w1 for the medical field for getting a citation from a top rated medical journal the same weightage will be given to a, um, a mathematics journal which is receiving a um, citation from a top rated uh, journal in the mathematics field so that means uh, depending upon the field or the source we normalize it and then calculate the uh, value or the score value or ranking value that's what snip uh, shows so it's it's a very uh, good metric value which was proposed by hang of moyer from university of Leiden. so it's a very good a very good uh, metric value where they give importance to the source of the field that's what snip shows and this is the uh, website where you can get all these snir sjr and uh, site score values and this is also the site which i was referring at the beginning in the ugc care list you can you can click you can, you can go to this particular link by clicking at the scopus database link so it's directly comes to this particular uh, link it's nothing but uh, the scopus.com slash sources this is the site that i'm talking about so when you click that link in the ugc care list it's coming to the same website and coming here you can select the title option from this drop down menu and then enter the title of the journal then you will get uh, the site score of that particular journal it's it, it, it's like this suppose you are uh, giving the title as uh, neurocomputing here you can select the title here type neurocomputing here and then press find sources it will show neurocomputing here so the name of the journal is neurocomputing and the site score is uh, 5.0 and the citations received the percentile of that particular domain the percentile of this journal out of, uh, in that particular domain all this is shown here uh, in this record so this is the scopus is actually scopus.com slash sources is a site where you can search for the journal and you can see whether the journal is indexed in scopus or not very easily by typing the title here or uh, you can give iss number also that option is also there in this drop down so you can give the iss number and check whether it is indexed or not and at the same time you also also get the uh, three year in bad factor known as a site score here okay so i think these are all SJR ranking that is not required. And if you are interested, if you you can download this uh, software known as the Publish or Perish, uh, site, uh, which is actually uh, supported by Google Scholar, Web of Science, and Microsoft Academy. So whatever database you want, you can use it. So I have also downloaded this uh, POP. The, the name itself is very interesting, Publish or Perish. And, uh, and it's known as a POP software. And, and there uh, it shows several different metrics. I don't have enough time. Maybe some other time we can talk about those metrics. There are several other metrics like HI index, WCR, um, um, HI norm index, uh, like that. Lot of uh, metrics are available. Um, so this this particular software shows all those metrics. Uh, so uh, this, this is how it look like. And in order to add your profile to this software, it's very easy. Uh, you can just install this software first, and then you can add your Google Scholar profile. I already told you know uh, this uh, the Google Scholar profile. This profile uh, link can be added uh, in the software. Here you can see this this button, Google Scholar Profile button. You can click and you can just copy that Google Scholar Profile ID there, and automatically it will add uh, your records here. And once it is added, you can see all those records, papers which I was which I have seen in the Google Scholar Profile that will be shown here. And it will also show the same citations and H index value here. Uh, the same number of citation H index value will be shown. Uh, here and in addition to that it also shows several other uh, metrics uh, which gives um, different different uh, which gives information about uh, different directions of uh, quality uh, so we can say here we will get more uh, parameters uh, for the evaluation of the research productivity 
from several perspectives because you can look at for example a researcher's productivity can be looked at uh, based off uh, the co-authorship that is also possible uh, because sometimes certain scholars will always uh, work along with other people they will not contribute anything um, their own so in such cases uh, they are um, uh, because always will be a member of a very large research group you may not be doing anything and still you will get a lot of papers so in such cases you can just calculate the hi index how many uh, individual h index you have got based on the co-authorship uh, average co-authorship value uh, so uh, so there's such such several metrics uh, which gives different dimensions uh, are included in the software so when you get time you just download it and use it and there are a lot of uh, documents also uh, available uh, along with the software so it shows how these parametric so how these metric values are calculated very really, very clearly they have explained so this is very good software which i am still using so those who are interested they can download it so i think now we are coming to the end of uh, session so if you have any questions you can you can ask uh with this marathon session we are at the fag end of the one week faculty development program on higher education during covid times and after challenges and opportunities organized by the internal quality assurance cell bishopur college mavilikera to say that uh, dr madhu as nayar's session was excellent would be an understatement thank you very much sir for the very exhaustive presentation on research productivity and quality i'm sure uh, that uh, it would have brought a lot of clarity to most of us uh, however there are certain questions that uh, we received uh, from our participants yeah. and uh, with your permission i'd like to read them out yeah yeah uh, this is uh, mr uh, this is surant naik from tagore government arts and science college puducherry okay. the question is for social sciences which yeah. journal is suitable and uh, because see um, for for each domain we will have a numerous list of journals i cannot pinpoint any specific journal in your domain because social science itself is a very vast domain you have several uh, journals published uh, in this field so what you can do is you can go to this um, uh, that web of science link which i have shown uh, there you can uh, you can access uh, the social science citation index list of journals you can you can you can give that category and you can download all the list of journals which comes under the social science citation index and then from that you can you have to select those journals which comes under your research domain because in social science itself there are several research domains you find out the appropriate journals to which you can communicate papers so the only thing is that you make sure that this journal is indexed under uh, social science uh, citation index so it's better you just uh, when you refer the papers in your domain you find out the top rated journals from the reference list that's a that's the best option that you can do you just go through the list of uh, references uh, and then you can you can just um, uh, find out the top rated journals and then you just go and see whether they are indexed in sci or not that will be the best option that you can uh, use or you okay. can download the list also from that website that is possible right fine so this is a uh, juli chandra from maharaja's college arnakulam uh, the question is how h index is calculated uh, for a particular period for a particular period i uh, that i have already told you h index is actually calculated for uh, the the productivity of a researcher uh, uh, i mean the total productivity of the researcher if you want to calculate it uh, for a particular period you have to remove all the citations uh, for those papers which has published up to that time and the remaining papers you have to consider it as a window and then you have to calculate in the same way that that's what i have just shown with the help of example you take only those papers in the period that you are mentioning and during that period you can uh, you can calculate you can you can uh, note down the citations received and then calculate the h index but all the softwares that i have just mentioned they calculate h index based on uh, the total research productivity but in the in the software itself they say i'm showing here see this i hope you are you are seeing that screen here you can see that uh, all the papers i have uh, checked it right so you can uncheck these boxes depending on the period so if you want to remove certain papers belong to uh, a period which you don't want to use you can uncheck all those papers because the year is given here in this column year is given so you can uncheck all those boxes so now when you uncheck each paper you can see the values changing here you can see the values changing here so you will right. get an h index for that particular period so that's very easy Uh, Dr. Praveen Kumar from Presidency College Chennai wants to know: While calculating the H index, yeah. can one include uh, self citations? That is possible because here uh, H index calculation does not exclude the self citations. 
but for the journals uh, the self citation is a very important uh, aspect because there is a there is a concept known as citation stacking citation stacking means i don't know how many of you have received email from uh, such publishers so certain publishers they will ask you to include as many references from the same journal uh, and you should not do that that is known as a citation stacking because they want to increase their impact factor uh, so uh, what the jcr uh, uh, journal citation report of clarivate analytics what they do is they every year when they prepare the this document jcr document they will look at how many self citations that each journal has received and if that value is above a particular threshold i don't know what is the threshold they have set don't ask me what is the threshold so there may be some threshold if if that threshold if the if the journal crosses that threshold they will include that uh, journal uh, uh, in the blacklist or they will blacklist the journal and they will lose their impact factor it has happened in the last year and i think last during the past it has happened several times certain journals have lost their impact factor only because of the citation stacking uh, so in such situation self citation is a very important aspect but for individual calculation uh, it's not a big uh, thing but see uh, when i say self citation means there are certain authors uh, i have to i have to reveal that uh, fact also there are certain authors who include their all research papers in the next paper to be communicated they are not bothered about whether it is actually related or not they simply put all the papers in the reference list please don't do that uh, when you include your papers in the reference list make sure that it is related to that domain if it is very much closely related to the domain there is no harm in uh, putting your paper in the reference list you should definitely do that okay so thank you so the uh, shanti kumari from raja sherfroj government college yep. tanjore wants to know does the impact factor specify the quality of the journal if uh, so then what about the low impact factor journal it means that it has no quality is it so okay see uh, the impact factor is actually uh, it's an average i told you uh, it only gives a very general indication about the quality of the journal it's not a final metric which can be used to assess the quality mm -hmm. of the journal because there are certain scientists who still don't accept impact factor as a uh, as a as an important metric but this is the only available metric value which can be very easily computed and shown as one of the quality parameters of the journal why i am telling this because um, uh, certain scientists have raised issue about the impact factor because sometimes what happens you know you might have published a paper in a high impact factor journal mm -hmm. but maybe hardly you might have received one or two citations for your paper but there are other authors who might have received uh, hundreds of citations for Uh, that particular paper that means they have published a classic paper in that journal so there may be a set of authors who are really contributing to the impact factor of that journal so those scientists will say that this journal is getting impact factor only because of our contribution and other authors they are just uh, have published one paper and they are getting very few citations and still claiming that i have published a paper uh, in a journal with very high impact factor so that's a fact that's the reason why some people don't accept this uh, impact factor and another important thing that i would like to pinpoint here is that please make uh, give importance not only to the impact factor but also to the reputation of the publisher that is very important because if you look at i to please spring elsevier uh, and world uh, scientific uh, taylor and francis uh, on wiley all these publishers have reputation and whenever they start a journal we can make sure that maybe in future in the near future they will receive a good impact factor so always give importance to the publishers too in addition to the impact factor right okay sir so before hello, i go hello anu yeah. yes sir yeah yeah jacob yeah. sandy sir uh, i was uh, i thought like after the questions we'll have the valedictory from you or should we have it right now sir yeah right now okay sir okay okay so uh, uh, for the benefit of the participants uh, right now uh, we'll proceed with the questions after the valedictory address by our dear principal dr jacob chandi sir hello friends greetings again from bishop moore college today i am very busy with an interview schedule for selecting assistant professors in economics i am extremely happy to see that the entire academic exercise has come to a successful closure the entire india has come together for this endeavor i hope all of you have benefited from this one week webinar i personally thank all of you 
all the resource persons who took all efforts and all research to make this seminar a fruitful one my special thanks to all my dear colleagues especially the iqsc coordinator dr ranjit mathew ibrahim dr linet joseph dr marin george dr divya dr anup nair chandrashekharan and dr sajan and all my friends at bishop mur college once again i thanks the participants who participated diligently in this webinar i welcome you all into the bishop mur college campus once again thank you god bless bye thank you very much sir uh hello yeah uh sir are you there madhu nayar yeah, yeah, sir yeah yeah yes yeah, sorry for uh, no, the, problem, no problem no problem uh, actually sir um before i proceed with the questions there's one request uh, on behalf of the participants that at last like to ask you yeah. whether your presentation uh, they want uh, they wondering whether your presentation could be shared with them I can, ppt I, I, i can send the ppt to one of your email ids you can just send it to the participants fine Fine. So we will uh, forward it, forward it to them, sir. Thank okay. you very much for the gesture. Uh, so the next question is from uh, uh, Surat Naik. Yeah. Uh, this uh, the question is uh, this can be read along with uh, I'm sorry uh, the question. I think this question can be read along with the previous question that Mr. Surat had asked. I think you can you can avoid the questions which I've already answered. Uh, so that will be fine. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do, sir. Like you know, there's a long, long list. Uh, this question, I suppose, is slightly different. Is asking as to how to measure productivity in social science research. Exactly, this is uh, this impact factor or H index value is not restricted to any science scholars. It can be calculated to the social science researchers too, depending on the citation track records that you have uh, in the uh, Google Scholar profile or in the um, in the Scopus database or in the Journal citation report database. So and I told you, you know, uh, this uh, Clarivate Analytics have uh, three major products, and that is known as the Science Citation Index Expanded, and uh, uh, the Arts and uh, Humanities Citation Index, and the Social Science Citation Index. So all the journals belonging to these three categories will be there in the JCR. So there is no separate um, uh, citation report being released for the different domains. This JCR is for the entire uh, field. So. your your journal's impact factor your h index value all will be calculated based on um, the citations that you receive which has been recorded in the uh, in the uh, databases which i have already mentioned like uh, scopus or google scholar or uh, what you call uh, this sci or web of science it still depends on that so it's not uh, um, i mean it doesn't mean that so social science people don't have the impact factor journals or you will not never receive Uh, any h index value no so all these are calculated based on these indexed journals so you will also get it yeah okay uh this is from praveen kumar from presidency college uh, chennai okay. is asking whether uh, to register in publin is an orcid id enough which one which which id o r c i d orcid id orcid id is not required for orcid uh, id uh, orcid id is not mandatory for registering in publin but there is an option in publons to give orchid id that is there okay. uh, that is possible but it's not uh, it doesn't mean that orchid is mandatory for uh, registering in publons but there is an option to link orchid with publons that is possible uh julie chandra from maharaja college arnakulam is asking like if somebody who asks the impact factor of the journal in which the article is published what should we give impact factor five year impact factor or uh, to cite the score see these three uh, uh, metric values which i have mentioned are uh, are actually measuring the same aspect but at different target periods uh, so if you are asked about an impact factor because in universities also we are supposed to give the impact factor uh, as part of the accreditation and all so we give only the two year impact factor unless specified as five year impact factor or uh, site score uh, but for certain journals for certain journals which are not indexed in uh, web of science right in such cases uh, we give the site score because they don't have um, uh, impact factor value in jcr because they are not indexed in web of science 
So for such journals, we depend on site score. Otherwise, even if the site score is higher compared to the JCR report, you should give the JCR value because that is the more authentic and accepted one. If somebody asks you what is the impact factor of your journal, you should first see whether it has got an uh, impact factor value in the JCR report. If it is there, that is the impact factor value, the two year impact factor value you have to give. Otherwise, some um, you can give the impact factor value, instead of impact factor value, you can give site score. If you are sure that this journal is not indexed in Web of Science, but it is indexed in Scopus. In that case, you can give the site score value if it is there. Um, the five year impact factor value, uh, you need to give only if it is explicitly asked. Otherwise, uh, you need to give only the two year impact factor. Uh, Balvinder Kaur from GGM Science College Jammu wants to know as to how can our previous paper come under self-plagiarism when we are giving proper reference in the communication communicating manuscript. Yeah. Please guide as to what to do in this case. See, um, you are always uh, free to refer your uh, previous article in your uh, next article that you are going to communicate. There is no harm in that. What I was talking about is that certain authors, uh, what they do is they will publish one paper today and maybe tomorrow what they do is they will use the same copy and make some slight modifications. We call it as some ornamental changes in the manuscript and submit it as a new paper to the journal. And that is known as the self plagiarism because it's entirely the same idea being again uh, being communicated to another journal without much modification to the uh, article. So that is that is uh, that is something that you should never do. So if you if you're really sure that this is entirely a new work, which is which is much different from the previous one. You, you write it in your own words. There is no need to copy it from your previous article. You can write it in your own words and uh, you can communicate it. Please don't copy paragraphs and paragraphs from the previous article and put it in your new article. That is actually self-plagiarism and it is also an act of plagiarism that should be avoided. Okay, so actually uh, a continuation to that question is how to overcome the problem of self-plagiarism in future communication of manuscript. That's part. I think I already answered that. Yeah, that's what we already answered. So I move to the next question uh, of Anju from Newman College, Thoduburam. Okay. Uh, and that this is the last question. Yeah. Why do we usually find a higher H index in Google Scholar than yeah. Scopus <laughs> for an author? Yeah, uh, this is one uh, question that I always get. I think from my profile itself, I think it will be very clear. If you look at my Pablon's profile and my Scopus profile and my Google profile, uh, you can see that in Google profile, I've got more than 1,000 citations. The reason is very clear. It's precise and crystal clear because Google indexes more number of journals and conference proceedings, uh, which are not indexed in uh, Scopus as well as in uh, SCI. Uh, so you can see that the number of citations will be lesser uh, in the case of uh, Publons because all the citations are based only on Web of Science index journals, right? Uh, whereas in the case of Scopus, then I told you it's the largest indexing site. So more number of conferences and journals are indexed there. So naturally you will get more citations and your um, citation metrics will be increased. And when you come to the Google Scholar, it indexes much larger than that because compared to the Scopus, the Google Scholar indexes more number of conference proceedings and uh, journals, which includes law quality as well as high quality journals. So naturally, um, um, uh, the, uh, the, the citation values, metric values will increase. But you might have seen that Google is also aware of it. And sometimes you can see that there is a, a change in the um, uh, citation value. Today, you may, it will be showing 500 as the number of citations. The next day, it will be showing 490, which means that the 10 citations we have lost because the Google is also eliminating certain journals from their indexing site, depending upon the complaints or depending upon this. I told you know, that there are certain predatory journals will get uh, indexed in Google Scholar, so they will remove it as and when uh, it was notified. Uh, so um, at present, I can say that Google Scholar indexes more number of journals and proceedings. That's why you get more citations uh, in Google profile. But um, but soon, I think uh, that 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 will change maybe in subsequent years because when there is a consolidation of all the journals in both these indexing sites, in all these indexing sites, this this scenario will be changed you will always have almost comparable citation patterns in all the three uh, indexes like Scopus, uh, SCI and Google profile. There will not be any change. But at present, there is a change in the number of journals being indexed in these three indexing sites. And that's the reason why you are getting three different values in three different uh, indexing sites. So I hope it is clear. Thank you very much, sir. With the plethora of questions that is that are inundating our chat boxes, 
it becomes very difficult to really uh, ensure that just, the questions are not repeated. Give, uh, uh, however, <laughs> this is all. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, however, this uh, uh, this response from our participants is also a sign of uh, the success of this uh, endeavor of ours. Okay. And uh, uh, starting from uh, Professor Rachit Shankar S. Nair, uh, who talked on 23rd of this month, to Dr. R. Selvam's three sessions that we have had, to Dr. Satish Kumar's session on uh, yesterday, and today's session by Madhusa, uh, this FDP can be said to be a veritable success. Uh, I would like uh, uh, to thank uh, the Kerala State Higher Education Council for the academic support that they've extended to us. I thank our dear principal, Dr. Jacob Chandi, for all the support that uh, he gave uh, to this endeavor of ours. The IQAC coordinator, Dr. Ranjit Matthew Abraham, was the backbone of this program and his very solid, very persistent, and uh, very methodical ways have ensured that uh, things go, don't go very miserably wrong because uh, this was a very difficult uh, thing for all of us to do. Uh, we never sat before a mobile phone or a laptop like this and talked to 150 plus people across the country. And I think with one participant from outside the country too. So it's been uh, the first time for most of us, first time for me, and we've all been jittery. Uh, there have been technologic uh, hiccups. There have been problems. Uh, we have had an issue with Google Meet, but we managed to safely... Uh, uh, migrate uh, to Zoom platform, and uh, it's because uh, our uh, because of the uh, of uh, the trust that we had in ourselves and the trust that the college management had in us. So I thank you, Ranjit sir, for all the solid support. I thank uh, my colleagues, Merin, uh, George, and uh, Lynette, ma'am, uh, from the Department of Physics. They've actually uh, been uh, doing most of the speed work or donkey work or whatever you call it. They've been the backbone of this program. Uh, along with Ranjit, sir, they, have, uh, they are the ones who ensured uh, that this goes through. Ashish, uh, sir, Devya, ma'am, thank you very much uh, for uh, all the support that you two have extended to us, uh, to us to, uh, for this program. And uh, all the participants from across the length and the breadth of the country, from, uh, from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, from Gujarat to the Northeast, You've been with us, you've supported us uh, through all the uh, little problems that we have had, and you have encouraged us in this endeavor. Thank you, our dear participants, uh, and I uh, hope that uh, this will not stop, this will not be a full stop, and that we uh, all will meet, we all uh, will meet, uh, maybe on online platform, and in the post-COVID world, maybe offline too, someday, somewhere. Thank you all very much. Thank you.